Chapter 15 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lost. When the three ladies entered Staunton Cottage, they were greatly surprised to find Captain Staunton and Lance there, both busy scraping lint, and still more surprised to see Dale bending over a fire with his coat off, diligently stirring the contents of a small tin saucepan. May was the first to throw any light upon the situation, which she did, directly the door opened, by rushing up to her mother and exclaiming excitedly, "'Oh, Mama, what do you think? I fell into the water and Bobby jumped in too, and a naughty shark hurt poor Bobby and made his leg bleed, so Papa and Mr. Evelyn and some sailors brought him home and put him to bed, and he's up there now, Mama, so poorly.' Mrs. Staunton turned mutely to her husband for an explanation. For a single moment she felt quite incapable of speaking intelligibly. Her mental vision conjured up a picture of her child in some terrible danger, and, in her anxiety, her mind refused to take in more than that one awful fact, overlooking for the time the circumstance of Bob having received an injury. The danger to which May had been exposed, that was all she thought about, all she could think about, just then, and until she had heard the story, she had not attention for anything or anyone else. So Captain Staunton bade them all sit down, and then he related the full details of May's adventure, with Bob's gallant rescue of her, and the unfortunate accident which accompanied it. It is not necessary to repeat the frequent exclamations of horror and admiration which were elicited from the fair auditors as the various details of the occurrence were related, nor to describe the convulsive way in which May was clasped to her mother's breast, and fondled and cried over by all three of the sensitive loving women together, as they listened to the story of her terrible peril. Suffice it to say that, when the narrative was over, the womankind went with one accord up to Bob's bedside, and there so overwhelmed him with thanks and praises that the poor fellow was quite overcome, so that Lance had finally to interfere, and with mock severity, order their immediate withdrawal. Later on, when the excitement had somewhat subsided, and while they were all sitting down quietly to tea, the ladies produced their nuggets, passing them round for inspection, and relating the manner in which they had been found. Lance's experience as a gold digger now served the party in good stead, for he had no sooner taken the dull yellow lumps into his hand than he pronounced them to be veritable nuggets of pure gold, and after extracting from the fair finders, as accurate a description as they could give him of the locality in which the discovery had been made, he declared his belief that one or more pockets of gold existed in the immediate vicinity of the pool, and said he would take an early opportunity of personally inspecting the spot. The somewhat exciting events of the day caused the party to sit up chatting rather late that evening, and about midnight they were startled by the sound of knocking at the door. Captain Staunton opened it, and there stood Dickinson, who explained with some hesitation that, being as he couldn't sleep very well, he'd made so bold as to come up seeing a light in the winder, to ask how the little missy was at her her ducking, likewise the youngster as had got his leg hurt. The skipper was able to give satisfactory answers to both inquiries, and Mrs. Staunton, hearing that someone was asking after May, came out herself and thanked the ex-boatswain's mate so sweetly for his interest in her child that the poor fellow went away more dazed than ever, but with a heart so light that he felt as if walking upon air. And during the short journey between the hut and his quarters, he solemnly and silently registered sundry fearful vows as to what he would do to anyone who dared so much as to think any harm of the inhabitants of Staunton Cottage. For the next two days, everybody was exceedingly busy, the men being hard at work at the shipyard, while the women felt as though they could not do enough for Bob, or make enough of him, Indeed, in their anxiety to show their gratitude and admiration, they, Violet and Blanche at least, let enthusiasm outrun discretion so far that they bid fair to do the patient more harm than good, so that Mrs. Staunton was fain at last to take him under her own exclusive charge, forbidding the younger ladies to enter the room more than twice a day, once in the morning and again in the evening, and then rigorously limiting their visits to five minutes on each occasion. The third day following Bob's accident was Sunday. This day was always observed as a holiday by the pirates, not, it need scarcely be said, in deference to the fourth commandment, but simply because the men insisted upon having one day of rest from work, a day on which the more sober and steady members of the band 
were wont to devote some little attention to the toilet and to the repairs of their clothing, while the remainder, by far the greater number, gave themselves up to unrestrained riot and drunkenness, a circumstance which, as may easily be understood, always caused a considerable amount of anxiety to the inmates of Staunton Cottage. But however anxious they may have been, however fearful that, in their unbridled license, the pirates might at any moment break in upon the privacy of the cottage and attempt some outrage, divine service was invariably performed twice each Sunday in the lower apartment of the cottage. The day in question was no exception to the rule, and when the party began to assemble for the morning service, they saw that Dickinson had posted himself at a little distance from, but with an easy hail of, the door. He was accordingly invited in, and when he made his appearance, with his hair freshly cut, his long bushy beard and mustache carefully trimmed, and his person decently arrayed in a nearly new suit of blue pilot cloth, he looked not only every inch a sailor, but also a very fine specimen of manhood. He entered with some show of diffidence, and seemed half inclined to beat a hasty retreat again, when Mrs. Staunton invited him to occupy a seat next to her. However, he remained, conducting himself with the greatest propriety during the service, and evidently still having in remembrance the forms of the Episcopal ceremonial. When prayers were over, Captain Staunton delivered, according to his usual custom, a short address, in which he strove earnestly to give a plain and comprehensive answer to the question which Dickinson had propounded to him in the boat. It is not within the province of such a book as this to repeat what was said on the occasion. Suffice it to say that the skipper so far succeeded in his object that, when the service was over, the strange guest went away a happier and a more hopeful man than he had been for years. He presented himself again at the evening service, remaining, at Mrs. Staunton's invitation, to listen to the sacred music in which the party generally indulged for an hour at the close of the day. Thenceforth he was a changed man. On the following morning, Lance announced that he proposed to make, in Blanche's company, a visit to the gold mine, as they laughingly called it. Blanche's presence was required ostensibly in order that she might act in the capacity of pilot, but no one attempted to pretend that he or she was blinded by so exceedingly transparent an excuse. Everybody knew how eagerly the occasion was welcomed by the pair as affording an opportunity for a long day's uninterrupted enjoyment of each other's society, and everybody had accordingly something jocular to say about it. But what cared they, these two, happy in the first rosy flush of mutually acknowledged love? They laughingly returned jest for jest, and set off in high glee directly after breakfast, saying they were not to be expected back at any definite time, as they should stay until Lance had made a thorough examination of the entire locality. Deeply in love, however, as they both were, they had the forethought to provide themselves with a good substantial luncheon, and Evelyn also slipped a tolerably heavy hammer and cold chisel into his pocket. Blithely the pair stepped out, for is not happiness always light afoot? And in due time, a much shorter time, by the way, than was occupied in the previous journey, they arrived at the brink of the ravine, and looked down upon the tiny crystal stream and the pool wherein the nuggets had been found. Lance took in the geological characteristics of the place at a glance. He recognized the rocks as genuine outcrops of gold-bearing quartz, and the minute yellow specks therein as the precious metal itself, their visible presence being an indication of the extraordinary richness of the reef. "'Why, Blanche, darling!' he exclaimed, all his miner's instincts fully aroused as he chipped and broke off specimens here and there, to find tiny pellets and nodules of gold thickly clustering in each." This mine of yours is worth a nation's ransom. I do not believe there is such another reef as this in the whole world. With proper crushing machinery, we might all make our fortunes in a month. But let us take a look at the pool. Unless I am greatly mistaken, there is a princely fortune lying about here, and to be had for the mere picking up, without the need of machinery at all. They scrambled down the side of the ravine, and stood by the margin of the pool. Then Lance looked upward in the direction of the flow of the rivulet, attentively noting the run of the strata. Glancing about him, he saw a small broken branch lying on the ground at no great distance, and securing it, he cut away with his knife the sides of the larger end so as to produce a flat surface, making of the branch a very narrow-bladed wooden spade, in fact. Reaching as far forward as he could, he plunged the blade of his extemporized spade into the sandy bottom of the pool, 
pressing it gently down into the sand until he could get it no deeper, when he pried it upward so as to bring to the surface a specimen of the subsoil. Raising it very carefully, the end of the branch at length came into view, bringing with it a small quantity of yellow glittering sand. Some of this, by care and patience, he managed to get out of the water before it was quite washed away, and placing it in the palm of his hand, he gently agitated it to and fro beneath the surface of the water, until all the lighter particles were washed away, when there remained in his hand a minute quantity of fine yellow dust. There, he said, what do you think of that, Blanche? It is gold dust, my dear girl, and if we could drain off the water from this pool, and it might be done without much trouble, we should find plenty of it underneath that fine white sand. Now, let us inspect a little further. They accordingly began to walk slowly up the border of the stream, which descended the ravine by a series of miniature cataracts a foot or so in height, usually with small sandy-bottomed basins beyond. One of these basins proved to be so small and so shallow that, standing on a projecting ledge of rock, Lance was able to make a tolerably thorough examination of its bed with the aid of the before-mentioned branch, and he had not been very long stirring up the sand with it when he turned up four very fine nuggets, varying in size from a hen's egg to a six-pound shot. "'Just as I expected,' he exclaimed. "'Now, the spot from which this gold originally came is at the head of this ravine. These nuggets have all been brought down here by the water, and the higher we go, the larger will the nuggets be, because, of course, the heaviest of them will have traveled the shortest distance. But before pushing our investigations further, I propose that we sit down here and have luncheon. This is a picturesque spot, and what is perhaps more to the purpose, I am frightfully hungry.' They accordingly seated themselves upon a great moss-grown rock, and partook of the contents of the basket with all the appetite of healthy people who had passed a long morning in the fresh, pure air. Luncheon over, and Lance having, at Blanche's request, or perhaps the word command would be nearer the truth, lighted a cigar, the pair proceeded with their investigations. The characteristics of the stream continued to be the same, short lengths of sparkling water flowing over a boulder-strewn bed, diminutive rapids, tiny cataracts, and occasional quiet pools between. One or two of the smallest and least difficult of these pools Lance cursorily examined, finding in each case one or more nuggets, the sizes increasing as the searchers made their way upward, and thus confirming Lance's theory. He did not, however, devote much time to the actual search for gold, his object was just then to trace the gold to its source, and, at the same time, to note what capabilities existed for damming off the most promising spots, with a view to future operations. A happy idea, as Blanche thought it, suddenly occurred to that young lady. "'Oh, Lance!' she exclaimed. "'What geese are we?' "'Are we, darling?' said her companion. "'Probably, if anyone happened to see us just now, sliding his arm round her waist and kissing her.' They would be inclined to think so. Nay, you need not pout. It is entirely your own fault. The fact is that you looked so pretty the temptation was simply irresistible. Was it? she retorted. Well, I think it very rude of you to interrupt me like that. Just at the moment I was about to give utterance to a brilliant idea. But seriously, Lance, dear, do you not think we could collect a sufficiency of this gold to purchase our freedom from these horrid men? Evelyn thought the matter over for a minute or two. I am afraid not, he said at last. I have not the slightest doubt about our being able to collect a sufficient quantity of gold. The ground seems to be absolutely gorged with it. But the difficulty would be in the effecting of an arrangement by which these fellows would be persuaded to release us after the payment of the ransom. They would take the gold and afterwards simply break faith with us. No, our services are of too much value to them, unluckily, for them ever to voluntarily permit our departure and we shall therefore have to follow out our original plan of escape, if possible, unless a better offers. But we will endeavor to possess ourselves of some of this enormous wealth, and we must trust to chance for the opportunity to convey it away with us. They were now near the head of the ravine, which seemed to terminate in a sort of cul-de-sac, a huge reef of auriferous rock jutting out of the ground and forming an almost perpendicular wall across the end of the ravine. On reaching the base of this wall, the tiny stream they had been following was found to have its source a yard or two from the face of the rock, 
bubbling up out of the ground in the midst of a little pool some three yards across. It was near this spot, therefore, in all probability, that the precious metal would be found in richest abundance. Lance accordingly began to look around him for indications of the direction in which he ought to search. About ten feet up the face of the rock wall he saw what appeared to be a fissure in the stone, and thinking it possible that an examination of this fissure might aid him, he, with some difficulty, managed to scramble up to it. When he reached the spot he found, however, instead of a mere fissure or crack in the rock, as he had imagined, a wide projecting shoulder of the reef which artfully masked a low, narrow recess. Penetrating into this recess, Lance found that, after he had proceeded two or three yards, the walls widened out and the whole place had the appearance of being an entrance to a subterranean cavern. Thinking that, if such were indeed the case, the discovery might prove of great value, as affording the party a perfectly secure place of refuge in case of necessity, he emerged once more and, discovering from his more elevated standpoint an easy means of descent, hastened down to Blanche, and informing her of his discovery, requested her to sit down and rest whilst he completed his explorations. He then looked about him for something to serve the purpose of a torch, and at length found a fragment of dry wood, which on being ignited promised to burn steadily enough for his purpose. Armed with this, he was about to reascend the face of the rock when Blanche begged that she might be allowed to accompany him, as she was sure she would feel lonely sitting out there by herself. Lance accordingly gave her his hand, and without any very great difficulty managed to get her safely up on the narrow platform in front of the opening. Relighting his torch, which he had extinguished after satisfying himself that it would burn properly, Lance led the way into the cleft, holding his brand well before him and as high as possible, and giving his disengaged hand to Blanche, who suffered from the disadvantage of being in total darkness, her lover's bulky form almost entirely filling up the narrow passage they were traversing, and completely eclipsing the light. Soon, however, they found the walls receding from them on either side, the roof rising at the same time, and when they had penetrated some fifty or sixty yards, they were able to walk side by side. It was a curious place in which they found themselves. The rocky walls, which met overhead like an arch, were composed entirely of auriferous quartz, the gold gleaming in it here and there in long, thin flakes. The passage sloped gently upward, whilst it at the same time swept gradually round toward the right hand, and though the air was somewhat close, there was an almost utter absence of that damp, earthy smell which is commonly met with in subterranean chambers. As they continued on their way, the rocks about them gradually underwent a change, the gold no longer showing in thin, detached, thread-like layers, but glittering in innumerable specks and tiny nodules all over the surface, so that, as the flickering, uncertain light of the torch fell upon the walls, they glistened as though covered with an unbroken coating of gold leaf. But this novel appearance, attractive as it was, was nothing to the surprise which awaited them further on. They had penetrated some eight or nine hundred yards, perhaps, into the bowels of the earth, and were thinking of returning when they suddenly emerged from the passage into a vast cavern so spacious in all its dimensions that their tiny light quite failed to reveal the farther side of the, or the roof. But what little they did see was sufficient to root them to the ground, speechless for the moment with wonder and admiration. The rocky floor upon which they stood was smooth as a marble pavement, apparently from attrition by the action of water through countless centuries, though the place was now perfectly dry. What chiefly excited their admiration, however, was the circumstance that the floor was not only smooth, it was as polished as glass, and in places quite transparent, while it glowed and sparkled with all the colors of the rainbow. They seemed to be standing on a surface of purest crystalline ice, seamed, streaked, veined, and clouded in the most marvelous and fantastic manner with every conceivable hue, through and into which the faint light of their torch gleamed, flashed, and sparkled with an effect of indescribable splendor. "'Oh, Lance,' whispered Blanche at last, "'was ever anything so lovely seen before?' A perfect palace of the gnomes, darling, is it not? returned Lance in his usual tone of voice. And then they stood awestruck and enthralled, as his words were caught up by countless echoes and flung backward and forward 
round and round, and in the air above them, in as many different tones, from a faint whisper far overhead to deep, sonorous, musical, bell-like notes reverberating round the walls and echoing away and away, farther and farther, fainter and fainter, until at last, after an interminable time, as it seemed to them, the sounds died completely away, and silence reigned once more. "'It is marvelous! Superb!' whispered Evelyn, not caring to again arouse the echoes of the place. "'Come, Blanche, sweetheart. Let us explore a little further while our torch still holds out.' Hand in hand, and with cautious steps, for the floor was almost as slippery as ice, they began to make the tour of this fairy-like cavern. But they had not proceeded a dozen steps before they were again arrested, spellbound. The walls, as far as the feeble light of the torch would reveal them, were of rock of the same character as the floor, only that instead of being smooth and even, they were broken up into fantastic projections of every imaginable form, while here and there huge masses started boldly out from the face, forming flying buttresses with projecting pinnacles and elaborate carved work, all executed by nature's own hand, while elsewhere there clustered columns so regular and perfect in their shape that they might have been transferred with scarcely a finishing touch of the chisel to the aisles of a cathedral. Where the light happened to fall upon these, the effect was bewilderingly beautiful, the rays being reflected and refracted from and through the crystals of which they were composed, until they shone and sparkled like columns of prismatic fire. Then a new wonder revealed itself, for on approaching more closely to the glittering walls, it became apparent that they were seamed with wide cracks here and there, the cracks being filled with a cement-like substance so thickly studded with nuggets of gold of all sizes that in less than five minutes a man might have gathered more than he could carry away. Passing along the walls, Lance found that it was everywhere the same, and that in stumbling upon this subterranean palace of the fairies they had also discovered a mine of incalculable wealth. Hastily gathering a few of the finest nuggets within reach, they set out to return. They had apparently made the entire circuit of the cavern, for there close to them yawned the black mouth of a passage. This was fortunate, as the torch had now burned so low, that Lance saw with consternation it would be necessary for them to make the greater part of their return journey in darkness. "'But never mind, Blanche, darling,' he said cheerfully, remarking upon this unpleasant circumstance. "'It is all plain sailing. There are no obstacles in our way.' And if we have to grope slowly along, still the marvelous sight we have seen is well worth so trifling a penalty. Give me your hand, sweetheart, and let us get into the passage, for I shall have to abandon the light. It is scorching my fingers as it is. Blanche silently gave her hand to her lover, a trifle nervous at having to traverse so long a distance in impenetrable darkness, and buried, who knew how deep, beneath the surface. Buried! The idea was a most unpleasant one just then, and she shuddered as they plunged hand in hand into the passage, Lance at the same moment flinging the charred stump of the burnt-out torch back into the great cavern behind them. Cautiously they groped their way onward, Lance feeling his way along the wall of the passage and making sure of his footing at every step by passing his foot lightly forward over the ground before advancing. In this manner the pair proceeded for what seemed to be a considerable length of time, at least Blanche thought it so, for at last she said with a slight tremor in her voice, "'How much longer do you think we shall be, Lance? Surely we cannot be very far from the entrance now.' "'No, we must be getting pretty close to it,' said Lance. "'But surely you are not feeling frightened, little woman?' "'Not exactly frightened,' answered Blanche. "'But this terrible darkness and this awful silence makes me nervous. "'It seems so dreadful to be groping one's way like this, "'without being able to see where one is going.' and then I have a stupid feeling that the rocks above us may give way at any moment and bury us. Not much fear of that, said Lance with a laugh, which went echoing and reverberating along the passage in such a weird, unearthly manner that Blanche clung to her companion in terror. These rocks, he continued, have supported for years, probably centuries, the weight above them, and it is not at all likely they will give way just now without any cause. I dare say the time does seem long to you, darling, but you must remember we are walking at a much slower pace now than when we passed over the ground before. Of course, we might walk faster since we know the ground to be tolerably even and regular. Still, it is best to be cautious. If either of us happens to stumble here in the dark, we might receive a rather severe blow. 
However, keep up your courage. We cannot be very much longer now. Once more they continued their way in silence, the ground sloping gently downwards all the while, as they could tell notwithstanding the darkness, and still no welcome ray of daylight appeared in the distance to tell them that they were approaching their journey's end. At length a vague and terrible fear began to make itself felt in Lance's own mind. Recalling the incidents of their inward journey, he tried to reckon the time which they had occupied in passing from the open air along the gallery into the great cavern, and he considered that they could not possibly have been longer than twenty minutes, probably not as long as that. But it seemed to him that they had been groping there in the intense darkness for two hours at least. No, surely it could not be so long as that. The darkness made the time lag heavily. But if they had been there only one hour, they ought by this time to have reached daylight once more, slowly as they had been moving. Surely they had not. Oh no, it was not possible. It could not be possible, and yet, merciful God, what if they had, by some dreadful mischance, lost their way? The strong man felt the beads of cold perspiration start out upon his forehead, as the dreadful, indefinable, haunting fear at length took shape and presented itself before his mind in all its grisly horror. He had faced death often enough to look him in the face now or at any time without fear, but to meet him thus to wander on and on in the thick darkness, to grope blindly along the walls of this huge grave until exhaustion came and compelled them to lie down and die, never to look again upon the sweet face of nature, never again to have their eyes gladdened by the blessed light of the sun or the soft glimmer of the starlit heavens, to vanish from off the face of the earth and to pass away from the ken of their friends, leaving no sign, no clue of their whereabouts or of their fate, Oh, God, it was too horrible. Not for himself, no. If it were God's will that thus he must die, he had courage enough to meet his fate calmly, and as a brave man should. Thank God he had so lived that, let death come upon him never so suddenly, he could not be taken unawares. Lance Evelyn was by no means a saint. He knew it and acknowledged it in this dread hour, but he had always striven honestly and honorably to do his duty, whatever it might be. With all his strength, and then, too, like the apostle, he knew in whom he trusted. No, Lance was not afraid of death on his own account. It was for the weak, timorous girl by his side that all his sympathies were aroused. Doubtless she, too, possessed a faith firm enough to enable her to meet her fate undismayed. He believed she did. But what terrible bodily suffering must she pass through before the end came? But perhaps, after all, he was alarming himself unnecessarily. Even now they might be within a few yards of the outlet and yet not be able to see it, because, as he suddenly remembered, the passage was curved from its very commencement. But then he also remembered the passage at its outer end was so narrow that Blanche had to walk behind him, and here they were, walking hand in hand and side by side, as they had been ever since they had entered this interminable passage. Blanche, said he, steadying his voice as well as he could, put out your hand, dear, and see whether you can reach the right-hand wall. He felt her lean away from him, and then came her reply in a broken voice. No, Lance, I cannot. Why, pet, he exclaimed, I really believe you are crying. Yes, I am, she acknowledged. Forgive me, Lance, dear, I really cannot help it. I shall be better by and by, perhaps, but, oh, it is so dreadful. You are very brave and very good to me but I know you must have realized it before now. The dreadful truth that we are lost here. Tut, tut. Nonsense, child, Lance answered cheerily. Why, Blanche, you will get quite unnerved if you suffer such thoughts to take possession of you. There, lay your head on my shoulder, darling, and have your cry comfortably out. You will feel better and braver afterwards. He put his arm round her as he spoke, and the poor frightened girl laid her head upon his breast, trustfully as a child, and sobbed as though her heart would break. Her companion let her sob on unchecked. He did not even say a word to comfort her. What could he say with that frightful suspicion every moment gathering force and strengthening itself into certainty? No, better not to say anything, better not to buoy her up with delusive hopes. And oh, how thankful he felt that the terrible task of breaking to her the news of their awful position had been spared him. The sobs gradually grew less violent, and at length ceased altogether. 
Then Blanche raised her head and said quietly, Now, Lance, I am better, and feel able to listen to the worst you can tell me. I will not ask you to give me your candid opinion of our position, because I know it is. It must be the same as my own. But what do you propose that we should do? Well, said Lance, as cheerily as he could, the first thing I intend to do is to light a match and take a glance at our surroundings. It was stupid of me that I did not think of doing so before. He drew a box of matches from his pocket. Being a smoker, he was never by any chance without them. And the next moment a sharp, rasping noise was heard, and a tiny flame appeared. The light, however, was too feeble to penetrate that Egyptian darkness. They saw nothing but each other's faces, hers pale, with wide-open, horror-stricken eyes, and his, with contracted brow and firmly compressed lips, indicative of an unconquerable determination to struggle to the last against this dreadful fate which menaced them. "'This will not do,' said he. "'We must improvise a better torch than this.' He fumbled once more in his pockets, and presently found a sheet or two of paper on which he remembered jotting down some notes relative to matters connected with the construction of the battery. These he folded very carefully, so loosely as to burn well, yet tightly enough to burn slowly, and so give them an opportunity for at least a momentary glance round them. Then he struck another match, applied it to one of the tiny torches, and raised the light aloft. As he did so, Blanche uttered a piercing shriek, and seizing him by the arm, dragged him back against the rocky wall of the passage. Then pointing before her, she gasped, "'Look, Lance, look!' Lance looked in the direction toward which she pointed, and grew faint and sick as he saw that they had been standing on the very verge of a precipice. A stone, dislodged by Blanche's hasty movement, had rolled over the edge, and they now heard it bounding with a loud echoing clang down the face of the rock, down, 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 the sound loud at first, growing fainter and fainter, until at last a dull muffled splash told that it had reached water more than a hundred fathoms below. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blanche and her lover have to swim for it. Stand close against the wall, Blanche, and do not move, commanded Evelyn, as the paper torch burnt down and went out. Now, he continued, I am about to light up another of these papers, and we must utilize the light to get past this gulf if possible. It will never do for us to remain where we are. The question is, in which direction will it be most advisable for us to proceed? We must devote a moment or two to a hasty survey of the place, as far as our light will allow us, before we move. Neither the time nor the light will be wasted, and it will be better that you should turn your glance upward and away from the edge of the chasm. Your nerves will then be all the steadier when we have to make a move. Now, I am going to light up once more. Another paper was lighted, and placing himself in front of his companion, or between her and the edge of the chasm, in order to guard against the possibility of her turning faint or giddy and falling over, Lance raised the light at arm's length above his head to glance round. As he did so, the tiny flame wavered, as if fanned by a faint draught. He looked at it intently for a moment, and noticed that the wavering motion was continuous, and such as would be produced by a steady current of air flowing in the direction in which they had been proceeding. Then he knelt down and held the lighted paper close against the surface of the ground. The flame burnt steadily for an instant, and then betrayed a very slight draft in the opposite direction. Then it went out, the paper being all consumed. He thought intently for a moment, then turned to his companion and said, Blanche, dearest, we are saved. Pluck up your courage, my own love, and thank God with me for showing us a way out of this terrible labyrinth. I don't understand you, Lance, answered the girl, trembling with agitation. Are you only saying this to sustain my courage a little while longer, or do you really mean that you believe there is a chance of our emerging once more into the blessed light of day? I mean, dear, that I hope and believe we shall escape. Listen, that bit of lighted paper has revealed the presence of two distinct currents of air flowing along this passage. That means that an outlet to the open air exists somewhere. The upper current, which is the warmer of the two, is flowing in the direction of that outlet, and all we have to do is to follow in the same direction, if we can, and we shall eventually reach the opening. 
Then let us proceed at once, Lance, dear, please, pleaded poor terrified Blanche. I feel as though I should go mad if we remain here much longer. I have a frightful feeling urging me, almost beyond my powers of resistance, to fling myself forward over the edge of that dreadful chasm which is yawning to receive me. Oh, save me, Lance, darling, save me for pity's sake. I will save you, dear, if it is in man's power to do so, answered Lance. But you must help me by keeping up your courage. You know I cannot possibly think and reason calmly whilst you continue in this deplorable state of nervousness. Now, I will light another paper, our last, and we will move forward at once. Keep close to the wall and be ready to give me your right hand as soon as the light shines out. Another moment and a feeble glimmer once more illumined the Cimmerian darkness. Holding the light in his right hand, Lance gave his left to Blanche, and they cautiously resumed their way. The ledge along which they were passing was about six feet wide, but a yard or two further on it narrowed abruptly, leaving a path barely twelve inches in breadth. It continued thus for a length of some twenty feet, and then widened out abruptly again, apparently to the full width of the passage. It seemed, in short, as though the terrible chasm terminated at this point. Luckily, Lance was the first to see it, and his resolution was at once taken. He dropped the lighted paper as if by accident, and extinguished it by setting his foot upon it. He knew that if his companion caught so much as a single momentary glimpse of the short but frightfully perilous passage she would have to make, her nerve would utterly fail her, and too probably a dreadful catastrophe would happen. So he resolved upon the hazardous attempt to get her past the danger blindfold. Tut! What a clumsy fellow I am, he exclaimed pettishly, as though in reference to his having dropped the lighted paper. Now I shall have to expend another match. But, Blanche, your nerves are still unsteady. The sight of this threatening gulf is too much for you. I think you would do better blindfold. Give me your handkerchief, dear, and let me tie it over your eyes. I will remove it again as soon as we are past the chasm. Thank you, said Blanche. I really believe I should feel better if the sight of that dreadful place were shut out. I can trust to your care and courage, but I confess with shame that, as far as I am concerned, I am thoroughly unnerved. Lance took the handkerchief, which Blanche put into his hand, and bound it gently but firmly over her eyes, arranging it as well as he could in the darkness in such a manner as to make the blinding perfectly effectual. He then led her cautiously forward a step or two until he felt with his outstretched foot the edge of the precipice, when, bidding her stand perfectly still and to cling firmly to the irregular surface of the rock, he once more lighted the short remaining end of paper, utilizing its brief existence to note well the perilous path they had to tread. "'Now, sweetheart,' he said briskly, "'do you feel better and fit to go on?' Oh, yes, was the reply, in a tone so bright and cheerful that Lance felt intensely relieved, and he forthwith set about the difficult task of getting his companion past the narrow ledge without further delay. By the last expiring gleam of his short-lived taper, Lance took one more rapid glance at the terrible pass, and then, as the thick darkness once more closed round them, he said, Now, dear, you must be very cautious how you move. Keep close against the rock, and take a firm hold of any projections you can find. Do not move until you have a firm hold with both hands, nor without telling me of your intention, as I shall keep close to you and give you the support of my arm. And do not loose your hold of the rock with one hand until you have secured a firm grip with the other. Now, have you a tight hold? Then move gently along, sidewise, and keep close to the rock. The dreadful journey was begun. Slowly and cautiously the pair groped their uncertain way along that narrow ledge, each pausing until the other was ready to proceed and Lance with difficulty restrained a shudder as once during the passage he felt that the heel of his boot actually projected over the awful ledge. A dozen times he felt outwards with his foot to ascertain whether the chasm was passed or not, and at last, with an involuntary sigh of ineffable relief, he found that there was solid ground beyond him as far as his foot could reach. "'Now stand quite still for a moment, Blanche,' he said. "'I am about to light another match.' He did so, and found that they had indeed achieved the awful passage, with some six inches to spare. At his very feet still yawned the hungry gulf, but they were beyond it, thank God, and once more in comparative safety. Hastily seizing his companion's hand, he hurried her far enough away from the spot to prevent her seeing the deadly nature of the peril to which they had been exposed, and then removed the bandage from her eyes. 
There, he said cheerfully, we are past the chasm at last, and now you may have the use of your eyes once more. Lighting another match, the imprisoned pair now pressed forward as rapidly as circumstances would permit, taking care to keep a match always alight in order that they might not stumble unawares upon a possible second chasm or other danger. They pressed forward in silence, except for an occasional word of caution or encouragement from Lance, both being far too anxious to admit of anything like a connected conversation. Suddenly Lance stopped short, to his sense of hearing, acutely sharpened by the long-continued death-like silence of the place, there had come a sound, fainter than the breathing of a sleeping infant, a mere vibration of the air, in fact, but still a sound. What was it? He knelt down and placed his ear close to the ground. Yes, now he caught it a trifle more distinctly, the faintest murmur still, but with something of individuality appertaining to it. It rose and fell rhythmically, swelling gradually in volume and then subsiding again into silence. Hurrah! he shouted joyously. The sea! The sea! I can hear it! Courage, Blanche, darling. Our journey is nearly at an end. One short half-hour at most, and with God's help, we shall be free. Again they pushed eagerly forward, with high hopes and grateful hearts now, and with every yard of progress the gladdening sound rose clearer and clearer still, until there could no longer be any possible mistake about it, it was indeed the regular beat of surf upon the shore. At length a faint gleam of light became perceptible upon the rocky walls in front. Gradually it strengthened, until the more prominent projections of the rock began to stand out bold and black against the lighter portions beyond. And at last, as the path curved gently round, their eager eyes were gladdened by the sight of an opening into which the sea was sweeping with a long, lazy, undulating motion, until it curled over and plashed musically, upon a narrow strip of sandy beach. They both paused for a moment, with one consent, to feast their eyes upon the gladsome sight, and to restore their disordered faculties. Then they saw that the long passage or gallery within which they stood terminated at its outer end in a cavernous recess, opening apparently on a precipitous part of the shore. The floor of the passage sloped gradually down until it met the short strip of sand upon which the mimic waves were lazily beating and a yard or two from the water's edge the sand was marked with a well-defined line of stranded weed and driftwood which indicated the inner limit of the wash of the sea. A single glance was sufficient to show that the auriferous rock had been left behind, that which now surrounded them being a coarse kind of granite. Pursuing their way, the pair soon stood upon the strip of beach. Then came the question, how were they to get out of the cavern now that they had reached its mouth? The sides rose perpendicularly, and the top arched over in such a manner that escape seemed impossible. Lance made several attempts on each side of the entrance to work his way out, but the face of the rock was worn so smooth with the constant wash of the water that the nearer he approached the entrance, the more difficult did he find it to proceed. And at last, failing to find any further foothold, he was compelled to abandon his efforts and return to Blanche, who meanwhile had been resting her tired limbs on the soft gray sand. Well, Blanche, he said, I thought our troubles were over when I first caught sight of that opening, but it appears they are not. There seems to be only one possible mode of escape from this place, and that is by swimming. Now, I can manage the matter easily enough if you will only trust me. The distance is the merest trifle. The water is smooth, and if you think you have nerve enough to rest your hands on my shoulders and to refrain from struggling when we get into deep water, I can support your weight perfectly well, I know, and carry you safely round to the beach, which I have no doubt we shall find at a short distance on one side or the other of the opening. It will involve a ducking, certainly, but we cannot help that, and if we walk briskly afterwards we shall take no harm. Blanche laughed. She could afford to do that now. If that is our only difficulty, it is but a trifling one, she said. I can trust you implicitly, Lance. And what is perhaps almost as important, I can also trust myself. I can swim a little, and if I should tire, I shall not be frightened, having you to help me. Very well, was the reply. That is better than I dared hope. Would you like to rest a little longer, or shall we make the attempt at once? Blanche announced her perfect readiness to make the attempt forthwith and without further ado the pair straightway entered the water, hand in hand, Lance first taking the precaution to place his watch in his hat and ram the ladder well down upon his head. They waded steadily in until Blanche felt the water lifting her off her feet, 
when they struck out, Lance regulating his stroke so as to keep close beside his companion. The water was delightfully warm, the sun having been beating down upon it all day, and the immersion proved refreshing rather than otherwise. It took them only about a couple of minutes to reach the mouth of the cave, and then Lance began to look about him for a suitable landing place. He had expected to find a beach on one side or the other of the opening, but there was nothing of the kind as far as he could see. Perpendicular cliffs rose sheer out of the water on both sides of the opening, for a distance of perhaps a hundred yards, and where the cliff terminated the ground sloped steeply down, with huge masses of rock projecting here and there, the foot of the slope being encumbered with other rocks which at some distant period had become detached and rolled down into the water. In bad weather it would have been death to attempt landing upon any part of the shore within Lance's range of vision, but fortunately the weather was fine and the water smooth, so they made for a spot which Lance thought would serve their purpose, and in another ten minutes succeeded in effecting a landing among the rocks. The scramble up the steep face of the slope before them was not without its perils, but this also was happily accomplished, and at last they found themselves standing safe and sound on tolerably level ground, just as the last rays of the setting sun were gilding the summits of the hills before them. Lance found that they had come out on the eastern side of the island, and as the harbor lay on the south side, he knew pretty well in which direction they ought to walk. They therefore at once set out at a brisk pace toward a large patch of forest fringing a hill at some distance in front of, but a little to the south of them. They had not gone very far before Lance, who was keeping a keen lookout for some familiar landmark, recognized a dip between the hills as the ravine up which they had passed in the morning, and altering their course a little, they came in about half an hour to the stream, which they crossed without difficulty, and then followed it down until they reached the pool in which the first discovery of gold had been made. Thence their way was tolerably easy, though in the darkness, which had by this time closed down upon them, they went somewhat astray while passing through the wood, and in another hour they found themselves once more safely within the shelter of Staunton Cottage, thoroughly tired out with their long and adventurous day's ramble. Their entrance was greeted with exclamations of mock horror at the length to which they had spun out the day's ramble, but Blanche's pale cheeks, draggled dress, and general done-up appearance speedily apprised her friends that a contretemps of some kind had occurred, and their jesting remarks were quickly exchanged for earnest and sympathetic inquiries as to what had gone wrong. Whereupon Lance, having first suggested to his late companion the advisability of immediate retirement to her couch, and bespoken Mrs. Staunton's kind services in the preparation of a cup of tea for each of the tired-out wanderers, proceeded to give a succinct account of their day's adventure, the recital of which elicited frequent exclamations of wonder, alarm, and admiration, the latter being vastly increased when he produced his valuable specimens, to which he had resolutely stuck through it all notwithstanding that their weight had proved a serious encumbrance to him during his swim. Now, he said in conclusion, the net result of the day's exploration amounts to this. We have discovered a mine of incalculable wealth. What are we to do in the matter? There is so much gold there, in the cave, I mean, that a short period of resolute and well-directed labor will enable us to collect sufficient not only to fully recoup the underwriters for their loss through the burning of the Galatea, but also to make every individual among us enormously rich. Are we to let it lie there and trust to the future for an opportunity to come back and fetch it? Or shall we make an effort now to collect what will suffice us and trust to chance for the opportunity to carry it off with us when we go? In answer to this, everybody declared at once, without hesitation, their opinion that an attempt ought to be made to collect and carry off the gold with them. Captain Staunton very sensibly remarking that if anything occurred to prevent the safe transport of their prize home, they could then organize an expedition for a second attempt, but that it would be folly to make a necessity of this if by some extra effort on their part the business could be managed without it. This point being settled, the next question to be decided was, how they were to set about the collection of the precious metal, for it was obvious that any attempt to absent themselves from their daily attendance at the shipyard would not only excite suspicion, but it might also provoke a very unpleasant manifestation of active hostility on Raleigh's part. Here Violet Dudley came to the rescue with a very practical suggestion. If you, Lance, said she, can contrive to mark the two passages out of the great central cavern in such a manner that we women cannot possibly mistake one for the other, 
and so go astray, we might perhaps be able to collect the gold and convey it to a suitable spot for removal, and when enough has been gathered, we can take our time about transporting it down here. An admirable suggestion, Miss Studley, said Captain Staunton. That effectually disposes of one part of the difficulty, but it will never do to bring the gold here. We could not possibly convey it on board the schooner without detection, even if we were quite sure of the success of our plan for making our escape in her. Do you think, Evelyn, the pirates have any knowledge of the existence of this cave of yours? I am pretty certain they have not, was the reply. There is no sign of any human foot having ever passed over the ground before our own, and it is so eminently well adapted for a place of concealment for their booty, and indeed for themselves as well, in the event of the island ever being attacked, that I feel sure they would, had they known of it, have stocked it with provisions and in other ways have prepared it as a place of refuge. It was only by the merest accident that I discovered the spot today. And but for the fact that our search not only led us up to the head of the ravine, but also actually caused me to scale the face of the rock, it would have remained undiscovered still. A man might stand within twenty feet of the entrance without suspecting its existence, and, unless he had occasion to scramble up the rock as I did, and in exactly the same place, he would never find it. Very well, then, said Captain Staunton. What I propose is this. Since the ladies are kindly disposed to give them, we will thankfully accept their services to this extent. Let them collect the gold and convey it to the edge of the gulf or chasm which you so providentially escaped tumbling into today. Then we men must undertake the task of conveying it to the other side and stacking it up in a position from which we can easily remove it with the aid of a boat. If we succeed in securing the schooner, we shall simply have to call off the mouth of the cave and remove our booty in that way. Can anyone suggest anything better? No one could. It was therefore decided that the skipper's proposal should be adopted, especially as it left them free to alter their plans at any time, should circumstances seem to require it. This decision arrived at, the party retired for the night, most of them, it must be confessed, to dream of the wonderful cave and the equally wonderful wealth of which they had been talking. The next day was spent by all hands, Dale included, at the shipyard. This individual had, ever since poor Bob's accident, manifested a growing dissatisfaction with himself, and an increasing amount of shame at the selfishness which caused him to live a life of idleness and comparative ease, while every one of his companions, the ladies included, were doing all they could to aid in maturing the great plan of escape. And now at last, shame at his unmanly conduct fairly overcame him. And on this particular morning, he startled everybody by putting in an appearance at the same time as the rest of the male portion of the party, saying in explanation that henceforward he, too, should go daily to work, as he was quite sure he could be of assistance. He was, of course, assured that he undoubtedly could be of very great use if he chose, and there the matter ended. But a rather unpleasant feeling was excited when Rally, who was always promptly down at the beach to watch the departure of the working party, noticed and commented upon Dale's presence. Aha, my fine fellow, he remarked sneeringly. So you have made up your mind to go to work at last, have you? That is very well, sire. You must surely have dreamed last night that I had my eye on you. You think, perhaps, I have not taken notice, but I have. And if you had not gone to work today, I should have said to you, Look here, my good man. Suppose you not work, you not eat. And I should have stopped your allowance. But you are going to work, so now that is all right. It certainly served Dale right, but all the same it was a disagreeable sensation to the rest to feel that this sly Greek had been, in all probability, keeping a stealthy watch upon them and their movements. They inwardly resolved to be very much more circumspect in their goings out and in their comings in for the future, and they lost no time either in communicating this resolve to each other. All day long their thoughts were busy upon the subject of the gold mine, and by the time that they got back to the cottage that evening, each man had an idea in connection with it to communicate to the others. They were unanimous upon one point, which was that, after Raleigh's remark to Dale in the morning, and the espionage which it seemed to suggest, it would be most unwise for any of the male portion of the party to visit the cave during the day. Henceforward their visits there would have to be as few and far between as possible, and such visits as were unavoidable must be made during the night. With the women it would, of course, be different. They could now safely venture out every day, it was believed. And as the walk up the valley was the one which involved the least exertion, it would only appear natural that they should almost invariably take it. 
but, in order to disarm suspicion, in case anything of the kind happened to exist, it was deemed best that an occasional walk should be taken in some other direction until they could resume the road toward the ravine with the certainty that they had not been watched and followed. It was further agreed all round that the task of carrying the gold, when collected, over the most dangerous part of the path along the edge of the ravine was not to be thought of, especially as Captain Staunton had thought out a plan by which all danger might be completely avoided. His idea was exceedingly simple, and consisted merely in the erection on each side of the chasm of a short, stout pair of shears, connected together at their heads by a good, strong, sound piece of rope, having rove upon it a thimble with a pair of clip-hooks attached. The gold could then be put into a canvas bag suspended from the clip-hooks, and, with the aid of a hauling line, hauled easily enough across the chasm to the other side. These details agreed upon, they determined to proceed with their arrangements that same night. Accordingly, as soon as the evening meal was over, the men retired to their bunks for a few hours' sleep, all, that is to say, except Dale, who, quite unaccustomed to bodily labor, felt thoroughly exhausted with his day's work, and was therefore readily excused. He volunteered, however, to remain up on watch until all the lights in the pirate's quarter were extinguished, and then to take a good look round the settlement, and call the others when all was quiet, a raid upon the capstan house being the first thing necessary to enable them to carry out their plans successfully. The pirates, working hard all day in the open air, were, as a rule, tolerably early birds, and by eleven o'clock that night the place was wrapped in darkness and repose. Having thoroughly satisfied himself that this was the case, and that the coast was quite clear for his comrades, Dale roused the latter and then tumbled into his own berth with the comforting reflection that he had at last taken the right course, and done something to regain that respect from his companions which he was beginning to be acutely conscious of having forfeited. Five minutes later, four forms might have been seen, had anyone been on the lookout, stealing quietly across the open space between Staunton Cottage and the Capstan House. Fortunately, no one was on the lookout, and they reached the building undiscovered, ascended the ladder, and found themselves standing in the thick darkness which enshrouded the long, loft-like apartment. Here Lance promptly produced his box of matches, and, on striking a light, they were fortunate enough to discover hanging to a nail near the door a lantern ready trimmed. This they at once lighted, and carefully masking it, proceeded to rummage the place for such things as would be likely to prove useful to them. The place was almost like a museum in the variety of its contents, and they were not long in confiscating a dozen fathoms of three-inch rope, the remains of a coil of ratlon, a small ball of spun yarn for seizings, a sledgehammer, an axe apiece, a marlin spike, a few long spike nails, which Lance decided would be capital tools for the ladies to use in picking out the nuggets, and a few other trifling matters. Then, hanging the lantern upon its nail once more, they extinguished it, and made the best of their way down the ladder again. A pause of a minute or so to look round and assure themselves that no midnight prowler was in their vicinity, and they set off at a brisk pace up the valley, lighted on their way by the clear, soft effulgence of the star-studded sky. They were not long in reaching the shelter of the dense wood at the head of the valley, and once fairly through it, they laid down the bulk of their booty where they could easily find it again, and, returning to the wood, selected a couple of young pines which they quickly felled. The branches were soon lopped off, after which they cut from the tall slender trunks four spars about ten feet in length to serve for shears. Shouldering these, they sought out the remainder of their belongings and, by this time pretty heavily loaded, continued their way into and up the ravine, arriving at last, under Lance's guidance, at the great rock which veiled the entrance to the cavern. Lance and Brooke at once scrambled up to the narrow ledge before the entrance, taking with them the rat line and such other small matters as they could carry, while Captain Staunton and Rex remained below to bend on and send up the remainder. Many hands, especially if they be willing, make light work, and a quarter of an hour suffice to transfer everything, themselves included, to the ledge. Torches, chopped out of the remainder of the pines, were then lighted, and, once more loading up their possessions, they plunged boldly into the cavern, Lance as pilot leading the way. In about half an hour they found themselves standing in the great central hall or cavern, which, 
lighted up as it now was by the glare of four flaming torches, looked more bewilderingly beautiful than ever. A hurried glance round was, however, all that they would now spare themselves time to take. And then they at once set vigorously to work. The first thing necessary was to mark in a legible manner, and in such a way that the mark could be identified in the darkness if need be, the inner extremity of the passage through which they had just passed. Rex and Brooke undertook to do this, and as they had already agreed what the mark should be, these two began, with the aid of the sledgehammer and a spike, to chip in the face of the rock a circular depression on the right-hand side of the passage, at a height of about three feet from the ground, so that it could easily be found and identified in the dark by a mere touch of the hand. Leaving these two busily employed, Lance and Captain Staunton hurried away in search of the other passage. They soon found an opening which proved to be the right one, though a third was afterwards found to exist further along the circular wall of the cavern. The second, however, was the passage they wanted, for, on going a short distance into it, Lance's and Blanche's footprints were distinctly traceable in a thin coating of fine dust which was met with. The identity of the passage being thus established, it was marked in a similar way to the other, but with a cross instead of a circle. The marking of the two passages proved to be a long and tedious job, owing to the hardness of the rock and the imperfect character of the tools. But it was done at last, and then they set out to execute the real task of their journey, namely, the erection of the shears. Now that they had lights, the journey along the second passage to the spot where the shears were to be erected was accomplished in a trifle less than an hour. But a shudder ran through them all as, following the footprints, they saw that Blanche had twice or thrice walked for several yards on the extreme verge of the yawning chasm without being aware of it. And when at last they came to the narrowest part of the path, that which Blanche had traversed blindfold, they felt their very hair rising as they craned over the edge and heard the pebbles they threw in go bounding down until the sound of their ultimate splash in the water was so faint as to be hardly distinguishable. It was nervous work, the passage along that narrow ledge, but it had to be done, and they did it, hauling the poles across afterwards with the aid of the rope, and this part of the work successfully accomplished, the rest was not long in the doing. Another hour saw both pairs of shears erect, properly stayed, and the three-inch rope bridge strained across, with the clip hooks and hauling line attached, and, in short, everything ready for the commencement of operations. The axes and other matters were then taken back to the great central chamber where they were left for future use, and the party made the best of their way into the open air, and thence homeward, arriving finally at Staunton Cottage about an hour before the great bell rang the summons for all hands to come forth to another day's labor. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bob Wants to be Rich. The problem as to the working of the gold mine being so far satisfactorily solved, it only remained to ascertain how the arrangements would answer when put into practice, and this the ladies did without loss of time. Their plan was that one of them should remain at home to look after Bob and little May, while the other two devoted a few hours of the day to the cave. As they took it in turns to remain at home in the capacity of nurse, each of them had two days in the cave to one at the cottage. In the meantime, thanks to Lance's skill and the careful nursing of the ladies, Bob was making steady progress toward recovery, and within a month of the occurrence of his accident was beginning to ask how much longer he was going to be kept a prisoner. He had been made aware of the gold discovery by occasional references to it on the part of the others in his presence but he had never heard the complete story. So one day, when it was Blanche's turn to remain at home, he asked her to give him the entire history, which she did. He listened most attentively, and when the story was over, remained silent, apparently wrapped in profound thought for several minutes. Looking up at last, with a flush of excitement on his face, he exclaimed, Why, there must be gold enough there to make millionaires of every one of us. Yes, said Blanche, I believe there is. At least Lent... Mr. Evelyn says so, and I have no doubt he knows. Oh, yes, exclaimed Bob enthusiastically. He knows. I believe he knows everything. And what a splendid fellow he is, isn't he, Miss Lascelles? This last with a sly twinkle in his roguish eye. 
Blanche appeared to think it unnecessary to comment upon or reply to this remark. At all events, she remained silent. But the window curtain somehow needed adjustment just at that moment, and the haste with which she rose to attend to this little matter, or something else, caused a most lovely pink flush to overspread her cheeks. Bob saw it. Perhaps he knew exactly what caused it, but if he did, he was too much of a gentleman to show that he had noticed it. So when Blanche had adjusted the curtain to her satisfaction, he remarked with a heavy sigh, "'Oh, dear, I wish I was well enough to be out and at work again. I long to have the handling of some of that gold.' "'You must have patience, Robert,' said Blanche. "'The worst part of your illness is now over, and in due time you will no doubt be able to take your share of the work once more. But whether such is the case or not, you may rest satisfied that you will have your share of the gold. Whatever there may be, whether it be much or little, I know the gentlemen have decided that it shall be divided equally among us, even to little May. I am sure it's very kind of them, said Bob, with a touch of impatience in his tone, but I want to be up and able to work at it, to gather it in and see it accumulate. I want to be a really rich man. For shame, Robert, said Blanche, with just the faintest feeling of disgust the first she had ever experienced toward Bob. If you talk like that, I shall leave you. I am disappointed in you. I should never have suspected you of being mercenary. Well, I am then, returned Bob, quite unabashed. I am mercenary, if that means being anxious to be rich. And so would you be, Miss Lascelles, if you had seen as much misery as I have. Misery, too, which could be cured by the judicious expenditure of comparatively trifling sums of money. Only think how jolly it would be to go up to every poor hungry man, woman, and child you met, clap a sovereign in their hands, and say, There, go and enjoy the luxury of a good, unstinted meal for once in your life. But a rich man's power goes a great deal further than that. If ever I am rich, I shall not be satisfied with the bestowal of relief of such a very temporary kind as a solitary meal amounts to. I shall hunt up some really deserving cases and put them in the way of earning their own livings, Real relief consists, to my mind, of nothing short of the stretching out of a helping hand and lifting some poor soul clean out of that miserable state where one's very existence depends upon the fluctuating charity of one's fellow creatures. I've seen it, and I know what it means. There's any amount of real misery to be met with in the neighborhood of the docks, aye, and all over London, for that matter, if one only chooses to keep one's eyes open. Of course, I know that many of the beggars and match-sellers and people of that kind are rank loafers, too idle to work even when they have the chance, people who spend and drink every penny that's given them, and in my opinion they richly deserve all the misery they suffer. But there are plenty of others who would be only too happy to work if they could, and they are the people I should seek out and help. The poor women and children, you know. It makes me fairly sick, I give you my word, Miss Lascelles, when I think of the vast sums of money that are squandered every year in ways which leave nothing to show for the expenditure. Take gambling, for instance. I have heard that thousands of pounds are lost every year at card playing and horse racing. The money only changes hands, I know. But what good does it do? If a man can afford to part with a thousand pounds in such a way, how much better it would be for him and everybody else if he would expend it in furnishing a certain number of persons with the means to earn their own living. I don't believe it's right for people to squander and waste their money. I believe that money is given to people in trust and that everybody will have to answer for the way in which they discharge that trust. Don't you, Miss Lascelles? Certainly I do, Robert, answered Blanche very gravely, but I must admit that I have never until now viewed the matter in the serious light in which you put it. I must beg your pardon, and I do most sincerely, for the way in which I spoke to you just now. I had no idea that you had any such good reasons as you have given for desiring to be rich. But what would you be able to do single-handed, no matter how rich you might be? Ah, ejaculated Bob with a gesture of impatience. That's just what everybody says, and that's exactly where the mischief lies. They don't do anything because they can't do everything, and because they can't get others to join them. But I shouldn't look at it like that. I should just do my duty, whether other people did theirs or not. If others choose to shirk their duty, it is their own lookout. It affords no excuse for me to shirk mine. But there, it's no use for me to talk like this. Perhaps I never shall be rich. The gold is there, you say, but that is a very different thing from having it banked in England. How do they think they are going to get it away from the island without discovery? You may depend upon it that, whenever we go, it will be all in a hurry. Blanche explained Captain Staunton's plan as to the carrying off of the gold, but Bob shook his head dubiously. 
It is a capital plan, I admit, he said, but its success depends upon everything turning out exactly as arranged, and, you mark my words, things won't turn out that way at all. They never do. Will you do me a favor, Miss Lascelles? Certainly I will, Robert, provided, of course, that it is in my power, answered Blanche. Thank you, said Bob. You can do it easily enough. Bring home here, and get the other ladies to do the same, every day when you return from the cavern, as many nuggets as you can conveniently carry, say, two or three pounds weight each of you, you know, and hand them over to me. I'll contrive to find a safe hiding place for them, and when the moment comes for us to be off, I'll see that they go with us if such a thing is at all possible. Then we shall not be quite destitute if, after all, we have to leave the heap in the cave behind us. But don't say anything about this to the gentleman. Captain Staunton might not like it if he heard that I doubted the practicability of his plan. Blanche readily gave the desired promise, and there the matter ended for the time. Meanwhile, the work went steadily forward at the shipyard, and by the time that Bob was once more able to go on duty, the framework of the schooner was complete, and the planking had been begun, whilst the battery was in so forward a state that another fortnight would see it ready to receive the guns. Raleigh was in a high state of delight, but Bob had not been at work many days before he discovered that things were no longer as they had been when he received his hurt. The Greek had never been courteous in his behavior to the Galatea party, but now he was downright insolent, and his insolence seemed to increase every day. At the outset of the work, the gentlemen of the party, that is to say, Captain Staunton, Lance, and Rex, had been required to look on and direct the progress of the work only, but now Lance was the only one to whom this privilege was granted, a privilege which he scorned to accept unshared by the others, and accordingly, when Bob once more joined the working party, he found his friends with their coats off and sleeves rolled up to the shoulders, performing the same manual labor as the rest. Seeing this, he of course did the same, and thus they all continued to work until the end came. Bob was greatly surprised at this state of things, so much so that he sought an early opportunity to inquire of Lance the meaning of it. Neither Lance nor anyone else in the party were, however, able to give any explanation of it. All they could say with regard to the affair was that Raleigh had been gradually growing more insolent and tyrannical in his treatment of them, until matters had reached the then existing unpleasant stage. But he was earnestly cautioned by Captain Staunton not to mention a word respecting it to the ladies, as it was extremely desirable that they should be kept for as long a time as possible quite free from all anxiety of every kind. "'But can nothing be done to make this fellow mend his behavior? inquired Bob of the skipper, as they separated from the rest of the working party and walked toward the cottage on landing from the boats that night. I fear not, was the reply. While the schooner and the battery were still to be built, we had the man to some extent in our power. But now that the battery is so near completion and the hull of the schooner fully modeled, he is independent of us, and he has sense enough to know it. His own people are quite capable of finishing off the schooner now that her framework is complete, so that threats on our part would be useless, nay, worse than useless, since they would only irritate him and lead to increasing severity toward us. Bob lay awake a long time that night, quite satisfied that the time had arrived when something ought to be done, but what that something should be he puzzled his brain in vain to discover. About a fortnight after this a serious accident occurred at the shipyard, or rather at the battery. This structure was now so far advanced that it was ready to receive the guns which were intended to be mounted in it. The armament was to consist of six 24-pounder iron muzzle loaders of the ordinary old-fashioned type to which Johnson had helped himself in some raid on the Spanish-American coast. And on the morning in question, a gang of men was told off to hoist these guns up the cliff into the battery. Lance had, as a matter of course, undertaken the supervision of this operation, but the work had hardly commenced when Raleigh made his appearance on the scene, announcing his intention to himself direct operations at the battery, and roughly ordering Lance to return at once to his work on the schooner. And to be quick about it, too, or he, Raleigh, would freshen his way. Evelyn, of course, returned at once to the shipyard without condescending to bandy words with the Greek, and the work went forward as usual. Raleigh soon had a pair of shears rigged, and in due time one of the guns was slung ready for hoisting. Lance had been watching Raleigh's operations, first with curiosity and afterwards with anxiety, for he soon saw that the man knew nothing whatever about handling heavy guns. 
he now saw that the gun which was about to be hoisted was wrongly slung, and that an accident was likely enough to result. So, forgetting his former rebuff, he threw down his tools and hurried to the place where the men were working about the gun and told them to cast off the slings. "'You have slung it wrong, lads,' said he, "'and unless you are very careful, some of you will be hurt. Cast off the slings, and I will show you the proper way to do it.' The men, accustomed to working under his directions, were about to do as he bade them, when Raleigh looked over the parapet and angrily ordered them to leave the lashings as they were, and to sway away the gun. "'As for you, Mr. Soldier,' he said, shaking his fist at Lance, "'you have left your work contrary to my orders, and I will seize you up to a grating and give you five dozen to-night as a lesson to you. Now go.' Lance turned on his heel and walked away. Things had come to a crisis at last, he thought, and he began to wonder how the crisis was to be met. Upon one thing he was quite resolved, and that was that he would never submit to the indignity of the lash. Raleigh might kill him if he chose, but flog him never. His somber meditations were brought to an abrupt ending by a sudden crash accompanied by a shout of consternation in the direction of the battery. Looking that way, he saw the tackle dangling empty from the shears, with the lower block about halfway up the cliff face, and at the base of the cliff were the men grouped closely together about some object which was hidden by their bodies. Suddenly one of the men left the rest and ran toward the shipyard shouting for help. There has been an accident, thought Lance. The gun has slipped from the slings, and likely enough somebody is killed. Muster all the crowbars and handspikes you can, lads, said he, and take them over to the battery. There has been an accident, I fear. A strong relief gang was soon on the spot, only to find Lance's fears confirmed. The gun had been hoisted nearly halfway up the cliff when the guide rope had fouled a rock. The armorer had stepped forward to clear it, and in doing so had given it a jerk which had canted the gun in its slings, and before the unfortunate man had realized his danger the gun had slipped and fallen upon him, crushing both his legs to a jelly. There was an immediate outcry among the men for Lance, an outcry which Raleigh would have checked if he could, but his first attempt to do so showed him that the men were now in a temper which would render it highly dangerous for him to persist. So he gave in with the best grace he could muster, and ordered one of the men to fetch Evelyn to the spot. On receiving the message, Lance of course at once flung down his tools and hastened to the assistance of the injured man. When he reached the scene of the catastrophe, he found all hands, rally included, crowded round the prostrate gun, and everybody giving orders at the same time, everybody excited, and everything in a state of the direst confusion. As he joined the group, Raleigh stepped forward with a smile on his lips, which in no wise cloaked his chagrin at being obliged to yield to the demands of the men, and began, "'You see, Mr. Soldier, we cannot do without you, it seems, after all. Just lend the men a hand to—' But Lance brushed past him without deigning the slightest notice, and pushing his way through the crowd— called upon a few of the men by name to assist him in relieving the unfortunate armorer from the ponderous weight of the gun, which still lay upon the poor fellow's mangled limbs. Such implicit confidence had these men in him, prisoner among them though he was, that his mere presence sufficed to restore them to order, and in a few minutes the armorer, ghastly pale, and with every nerve quivering from the excruciating pain of his terrible injuries, was safely withdrawn from beneath the gun. Now, make a stretcher, some of you. Ah, Dickinson, you are the man for this job. Just make a stretcher, my good fellow, the same sort of thing that you made for the lad Bob, you know, and let's get our patient into a boat as quickly as possible. I can do nothing with him here, said Lance. Aye, aye, sir, answered Dickinson promptly, and away he went with two or three more men to set about the work, Lance plying the injured man frequently with small doses of rum meanwhile. Raleigh stood upon the outskirts of the crowd, angrily watching the proceedings. He could not shut his eyes to the fact of Lance's popularity with the men, and he vowed within himself that he would make him pay dearly for it before the day was done, even if he were compelled to seize him up and flog him himself. The stretcher was soon ready, and the armorer, having been placed upon it, was carried as carefully as possible down to the boat. As the procession passed the shipyard, Lance beckoned to Captain Staunton, saying, "'I shall need your assistance in this case. It will be a case of amputation unless I am greatly mistaken.' and if so, I shall require the help of someone upon whose nerve I can depend. Captain Staunton, upon this, hurried back for his coat and rejoined Lance just as the party was on the point of embarking in the boat. 
As the men propelled the craft swiftly across the bay, Lance related in a loud tone to the skipper Raleigh's behavior during the morning and his threat. They were still discussing the matter anxiously together when Dickinson, who was pulling stroke oar, and who doubtless guessed from catching a stray word or two what was the subject of their conversation, broke in upon their conference by inquiring of Lance whether he thought the armorer would recover. "'It is impossible to say yet,' answered Lance cautiously. "'Of course we shall do our best for him, poor fellow, but he will require more attention than I fear Raleigh will allow me to give him.' "'If that's all,' remarked Dickinson, "'I think you needn't trouble yourself, sir. The Greek knows too well what he's about to interfere with you when it comes to doctoring an injured man, a man as was hurt, too, all along of his own pride and obstinacy. And as to that other matter, the flogging, you know, sir, axing your pardon for speaking about it so plain, sir, don't you trouble yourself about that. He shan't lay a hand upon you while me and my mates can prevent it, shall he, mates? No, that he shan't, Bo, was the eager answer. No, he shan't coincided Dickinson. We can't do much to help you, you see, sir, he added, cause worse luck, we don't all think alike upon some things, but we've only got to say the word to the rest of the hands, and I knows as they won't hear of you being flogged. There isn't one of us but what respects you, sir, but what respects you gentlemen both, for that matter. You've always had a good word for everybody, and that goes a long way with sailors sometimes, further than a glass of grog, and you may make your mind easy that the Greek won't be let to, to, you know what, sir. Thank you, Dickinson, said Lance, with outstretched hand. Thank you with all my heart. You have relieved me of a heavy load of anxiety. For, to tell you the truth, I had quite made up my mind not to submit to the indignity. And if Raleigh attempts to carry out his threat, it will probably lead to precipitate action on our part, which at the present time would be simply disastrous. So twould, sir, so twould, agreed Dickinson. You needn't say another word, sir. We understands. Only we'd like you to know, sir, and this here is a very good opportunity for us to say it, that whenever the time comes, you may reckon upon all hands of us in this here boat. How do you mean, ejaculated Lance, considerably startled. I really do not understand you. Oh, it's all right, sir, returned Dickinson cheerfully. We weren't born yesterday, narrow one of us. And you don't suppose, as we believe, you're all settled down to stay here for the rest of your natural lives, do you? Lord bless you, sir. We knows you must have got some plan in your heads for getting away out of this here hole. And the long and short of it is this. When you're ready to go, we're ready to lend you a hand, providing you'll take us with you. We're sick and tired of this here cursed pirating business. We wants to get away out of it. And we've been talking it over, me and my mates and we've made up our minds that you're sartin to be off one of these fine days, and we'd like to go with you, if you'll have us. We want to give the world another trial, and see if we can't end our days as honest men. Ain't that it, mates? Aye, aye, Bill, that's it, and no mistake. You've put it to the gentleman just exactly as we wanted it. What you says, we'll say, and whatever promises you makes, we'll keep em. We wants another chance. And we hopes that if so be as these here gentlemen are thinking of topping their booms out of this, they'll just take us along with them, replied the man who was pulling the bow oar, the others also murmuring in assent. But what makes you think we have an idea of effecting our escape? And how many others of you have the same opinion, inquired Captain Staunton. Well, I don't know as I can rightly say what makes us think so, but we do, answered Dickinson. Perhaps it's because you've took things so quiet and cheerful-like, as to how many more of us thinks the same as we do, why, I can't say, I'm sure. I've only spoke about it to some half a dozen or so that I knowed would be glad of a chance to leave, like myself. Well, said Captain Staunton after a pause, I really do not think we can say anything to you, either one way or another, just now. What you have just said has been so utterly unexpected that we must have time to think and talk the matter over among ourselves but I think we may perhaps be able to say something definite to you tomorrow in answer to your proposition. Don't you think so, Evelyn? I think so, answered Lance. Very well, then, said the skipper. Let the matter rest until tomorrow, and we will then tell you our decision. In the meantime, it must be understood that none of you say a word to anyone else upon the subject until you have our permission. A promise to this effect was readily given by each of the men, and then the matter dropped, the boat shortly afterwards reaching the landing place at the bottom of the bay. 
the armorer was at once taken out of the boat and carried by Lance's directions up to the building in which he slept. The miserable man was by this time in a dreadfully exhausted condition, but on the arrival of the medicine chest, Lance mixed him a powerful stimulating draught, under the influence of which he revived so much that Evelyn felt himself justified in attempting the operation of amputation. This, with Captain Staunton's assistance, was speedily and successfully performed, after which the patient was placed in his hammock, and Lance sat himself down near at hand, announcing his intention of watching by the poor fellow until next morning. The operation successfully performed, Dickinson and his three companions returned to the shipyard, maintaining an animated and anxious consultation on the way. The result of this consultation was that when the four men resumed work, they had a great deal to say. After answering numberless qu anxious inquiries as to the state of the wounded man, upon the subject of Raleigh's treatment of Lance and his threat to flog him. They denounced this conduct as not only unjust, but also impolitic, to the last degree. Dwelling strongly upon the unadvisability of offending a man so skilled as Lance in medicine and surgery, and impressing their audience with the necessity for discouraging, and if necessary, interfering to prevent, the carrying out of the threat. And as sailors are very much like sheep, where one jumps, the rest jump also. They had not much difficulty in arranging for a general demonstration of popular disapproval in the event of Raleigh's attempting the threatened indignity. Fortunately for himself, fortunately also, in all probability, for those in whom we are chiefly interested, he allowed the affair to pass over. In going about among the workers that day, he overheard enough to feel assured that, for the moment at all events, he was an unpopular man, and as among such turbulent spirits as those with whom he had to deal, unpopularity means loss of power. His own common sense suggested to him the extreme impolicy of pitting himself against them while they continued in so antagonistic a mood. But he was quite resolved that if he could not have in one way what he called his revenge, he would have it in another. And from that day forward, his insolence and tyranny of demeanor toward Lance and his friends grew more and more marked, until at length they became so unbearable that they were driven to the very verge of desperation. Meanwhile, Lance, sitting there watching his patient, soon saw that he was about to have his hands full. The hectic flush of fever began to chase away the deadly pallor from the sufferer's cheek. His eyes glittered and sparkled like coals of fire, and as feeling began to return to his hitherto benumbed limbs, and the smart of his recent operation made itself felt, he tossed restlessly in his hammock, tormented with an unquenchable thirst. Water, water, he muttered. For the love of God, give me water. Lance gave him some in a tin pannikin. In an instant, the vessel was glued to the unfortunate man's lips, and in another instant, it was drained to the last drop. More, give me more, he gasped, as soon as he had recovered his breath. But this Lance declined to do. Bidding the poor fellow be patient for a few minutes, he went to the medicine chest and mixed him a cooling draught. This also was swallowed with avidity, and then the armorer lay quiet for a few minutes. Not for long, however. He soon began to toss restlessly about once more, and by the time that the hands returned from their day's work at the shipyard, he was in a raging fever, raving mad, in fact, and Lance was at last compelled to have him laced up in his hammock to prevent him from doing himself a serious injury. Lance Evelyn will probably remember that night as long as he lives. In the delirium of the fierce fever which consumed him, the unhappy armorer was visited by visions of all the evil deeds of his past life, and Lance's blood curdled in his veins as he listened to his patient's disjointed ravings of murder, rapine, and cold-blooded cruelty of so revolting a character that he wondered how any human mind could conceive it in the first instance, and how, after it had been conceived, human hands could bring themselves to perpetrate it. And then the man's guilty conscience awakened from its long torpor, and, acting upon his excited imagination, conjured up a thousand frightful punishments awaiting him. He writhed, he groaned, he uttered the most frightful curses, and then, in the same breath, shrieked for forgiveness and mercy. It was perfectly appalling. Even his comrades, those who had shared with him in the dreadful deeds about which he raved, found the scene too trying for their hardened and blunted feelings and such of them as had their hammocks slung in the same dormitory abandoned them and slept in the open air, rather than remain to have their souls harrowed by his dreadful utterances. 
This terrible state of things existed until the afternoon of the following day, rather more than twenty-four hours after he had received his injuries. And then the fever subsided, but only to leave the once powerful man in the last stage of exhaustion. So completely prostrate was he that he had no power to so much as lift his hand, and he was only able to speak in the merest whisper. Now was the time when all Lance's skill was most urgently required. Fagged as he was by his long night of watching, he tended his patient with the most unremitting assiduity, administering tonics and stimulants every few minutes, and racking his brain for devices by which he might help the man to tide over this period of extreme prostration. But it was all of no avail. The poor fellow gradually sank into a state of stupor from which all Evelyn's skill was unable to arouse him. And at length, about eight o'clock in the evening, after a temporary revival during which all the terrors of death once more assailed him, his guilty soul passed away without opportunity for repentance, prayers and curses issuing from his lips in horrible confusion up to the last moment of his existence. His death was witnessed by several of his companions in crime, and while some had tried to laugh and scoff away the unwelcome impression which the scene produced upon their minds, there were others who went into the open air and wandered away by themselves to ponder upon this miserable ending of a crime-stained life. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Alarm and Disaster Lance's long and fatiguing watch beside the deathbed of the unfortunate armorer of course delayed, to some extent, Captain Staunton's reply to the suggestion which Dickinson had made on behalf of himself and certain of his comrades. But the skipper had, to save time, discussed the matter with the rest of the party, coming to the conclusion that they would be quite justified, under the circumstances, in accepting the services of these men, and on the morning following the armorer's death, Lance having enjoyed a good night's rest, his opinion was taken upon the question, with the view of giving the men an answer forthwith. Evelyn listened attentively to everything that was said, and then remarked, "'Well, gentlemen, I quite agree with you that the assistance which the men have it in their power to afford us would be most valuable. It would clear away a good many of our difficulties, and would go a long way toward ensuring success in our endeavor to escape.' an endeavor which I must confess I have always secretly regarded with a considerable amount of doubt and misgiving. It has always presented itself to me as an undertaking of a decidedly desperate character, and now it appears more so than ever, having regard to the very disagreeable change in Raleigh's treatment of us. The only question, in my mind, is one of duty, duty to our country and to the world at large. We must not forget that the men who now come to us with offers of assistance are men who have, in the past, outraged every law, human and divine, and justice demands that they shall be delivered up to punishment. Now, if we accept their services, we certainly cannot afterwards denounce them. It would be rank treachery on our part. How do you propose to overcome this difficulty? We have thought of that, replied Captain Staunton. It is the only question which has bothered us. And for my own part, I can only see one solution of it, no word has, it is true, been said by them as to our keeping their secret, but I think there can be no doubt that such a stipulation was intended to be understood. And, in any case, I fully agree with you that we cannot justly avail ourselves of their assistance and afterwards hand them over to the authorities. My view of the case is this. Here we are, in what is beyond all doubt a most desperate scrape. A chance, and a very slight chance it is, offers for our escape and most opportunely these men come forward with an offer of assistance. If we let slip this slight chance, it is extremely doubtful whether we shall ever have another, and that, I imagine, taking into account the future possibilities of evil in store for the helpless women dependent upon us, counts for something, and justifies us in accepting help from almost any source. Then, as regards the men themselves, it is undoubtedly true that they have committed crimes which place them quite outside the pale of human mercy, if justice alone is to be considered. But for my own part, I believe that they have repented of their past misdeeds, at any rate they say so, and we have no reason to doubt the truth of their assertion. They ask for an opportunity to reform, 
they desire a chance of making amends, as far as possible, for the past evil of their lives. And I have an idea, gentlemen, that though, in giving them such a chance, we might not be acting in accordance with man's idea of strict justice, we should be following pretty closely upon God's idea of it. He breaks not the bruised reed, nor quenches the smoking flax. And if he thus declares his readiness to give even the most doubtful and unpromising of his creatures another trial, I really do not see that we are called upon to be more strict than he is. My proposal, therefore, is that we should accept these men's preferred assistance, that we should do what we may be able to do for them in the way of giving them the opportunity they desire. And if justice is to overtake them, if punishment is to follow their past misdeeds, let it be due to some other agencies than ours. If God intends them to suffer punishment at the hands of their fellow creatures, he will provide the instruments, never fear, but I think it far more likely he will give them another chance. I, too, believe he will, said Lance. You take a view of the matter which I confess with shame had not presented itself to me, and I am convinced. These men have committed crimes of exceptional enormity, it is true, but it is not for us to draw the line, to say to whom mercy shall be granted, and from whom it shall be withheld. Therefore let us accept their offer, and leave the matter of their punishment in God's hands. Thus then it was decided, and Bob, as the least likely to excite suspicion if seen in conversation with any of the pirates, was deputed to inform Dickinson that his offer and that of his mates had been accepted, and to request him to call, without exciting observation, if possible, at the cottage that evening. When the gentlemen returned home at the close of the day's work, they found Blanche and Violet in a state of considerable nervous excitement, owing, they asserted, to their having been frightened that day while at their work of gold collecting in the cavern. On being asked for a detailed account of the circumstance which had alarmed them, Violet said, We had been at work about two hours, and had just reached the edge of the gulf with our second load, when we were startled by hearing somewhere near us a sound like a deep, long-drawn sigh, followed almost immediately afterwards by a loud moan. I have no doubt you will think us dreadful cowards, but it is no use concealing the truth. We simply dropped the gold and flew back along the passage to the great cavern at our utmost speed. Arrived there, we sat down to recover ourselves, and at length succeeded so far that we were both inclined to believe we had been victimized by our own imaginations. You know what an eerie place it is, and how likely to excite weird fancies in the minds of nervous, timid women like ourselves. So we summoned up all our courage and went to work once more. We naturally felt somewhat reluctant to visit the scene of our fright again, but we overcame the feeling and made our third journey to the chasm without experiencing any further shock to our nerves. On our fourth journey, however, we had reached the place, deposited our load, and had just set out to return when the same sounds were repeated, much more loudly than at first and accompanied this time by a loud, prolonged hiss, such as I should imagine could proceed only from some gigantic serpent. We were thoroughly terrified this time, and fled once more, not only to the cavern, but thence into the open air and home. I do not know how we may regard the matter in the morning, but at present I really do not feel as though I could ever venture into the place again until the mystery has been solved and the cause of those terrifying sounds discovered." "'Of course not,' said Captain Staunton. "'None of you must attempt to visit the cavern again "'until we have had an opportunity of investigating the matter. "'It is possible, though, mind you, "'I don't think it at all probable, "'that a serpent or large reptile of some kind "'may have made its way into the gallery. "'And, at all events, "'it will never do for you ladies to run the slightest risk. "'What do you think, Evelyn?' he added, turning to Lance. "'Is it likely that there may be a snake or something of the sort there?' Not likely, I should say, responded Lance. We have never encountered a reptile of any description, large or small, in the course of our rambles about the island. But of course there is just the bare possibility, I cannot put it any stronger than that, of a snake drifting here on an uprooted tree or large branch. I have heard of snakes being seen in the branches of trees, drifting down rivers in flood time, and there is no reason why, under such circumstances, they should not be carried clear out to sea. Whether, however, a serpent could exist long enough to make the voyage from the mainland to this island is, in my opinion, exceedingly doubtful. Still, I quite agree with you that the ladies ought not to make any further visits to the cavern until we have discovered the source of their alarm. 
This singular circumstance gave rise to a considerable amount of speculation among the members of the party, and they were still discussing the matter when a knocking was heard at the door, and, in obedience to Captain Staunton's stentorian, "'Come in!' Dickinson entered. "'Servant, ladies!' exclaimed the newcomer, with an elaborate sea-scrape. Then, seating himself in the chair which Captain Staunton indicated, he continued, "'Well, Captain, and gentlemen all, I've just comed up, you see, in obedience to your commands of the forenoon sent through the young gentleman there,' pointing to Bob, "'and to talk matters over, as it were.' "'That's all right, Dickinson,' answered Captain Staunton. "'We are very glad to see you. "'Robert, of course, told you that we have decided to accept the assistance of yourself "'and such of your shipmates as are to be thoroughly relied upon?' "'He did, sir, and right glad and thankful I was to hear it,' replied Dickinson. "'Of course we knowed right well, sir, how much heat we was axing of you "'when we offered to chime in on your side. "'We was just axing that you'd take us upon trust, as it were,' and believe in the honesty and straightforwardness of men as had proved themselves to be rogues and worse. But you've took us, sir, and you shan't have no cause to repent it. We're yours, heart and soul. Henceforward we takes our orders from you, and we're ready to take any oath you like upon it. No oath is necessary, my good fellow, said Captain Staunton. Your bare word is quite sufficient, for if you intend to be faithful to us, you will be so without swearing fidelity. And if you mean to betray us, an oath would hardly stop you, I am afraid. But we do not doubt your fidelity in the least. The only thing we have any fear about is your prudence. Ah, yes, there, sir, we may fail, said Dickinson, with a mournful shake of the head. But you give your orders, sir, and we'll do our best to obey them. But afore you lay your plans, I think you ought to know how things is standing among us just now. I'm greatly afeard you're like so many young bears, with all your troubles afore you. That Greek rascal, Raleigh, has been doing his best to stir up all hands of us against you, and particular against you, Mr. Evelyn, by saying as it was all along of you as the poor armorer lost his life. He holds as how you killed him by taking off his legs, and that you deserves to be severely punished for the doing of it. And there's some of the chaps as is fools enough to listen to what he says, and to believe it, too. But there's me and Tom Poole and two or three more. We're going to hold out to it that you did the best you could for the poor chap, and that if it hadn't have been for Raleigh's own obstinacy, the man wouldn't never have been hurt at all. And however the thing goes, you may depend upon me to give you timely warning. Thank you, Dickinson, said Captain Staunton. This information which you have just given us is most valuable, and renders it all the more necessary that we should promptly mature our plans. Now, to show you how thoroughly we trust you, I will explain those plans as far as we have yet arranged them. You can then tell us what you think of them, and you will also be better able to understand in what way you and your shipmates can prove of most use to us. Well, if that don't beat all, exclaimed Dickinson, after Captain Staunton had stated their plans, to think as you should go for to arrange to run away with the schooner herself, why, I thought the most you'd do would be to provision and seize the launch and go off to sea in her taking your chance of being picked up some time or another. Well, there ain't a soul amongst us, I knows, as has so much as the ghost of a Heidi about your taking the schooner. Some of the hands seems to have a kind of notion, I found out since I spoke to you the other day, that you may try to slip off some day if you gets the chance, but they just laughs at it, you know, and asks how you're to manage, and how far you'd get in a boat afore the schooner'd be alongside of you, and that like. But your plan's the right one, Captain. No mistake about that. And now, just say what you want us chaps to do, and we'll do it if it's any way possible. How many of you are there? asked the skipper. How many, I mean, upon whom we can absolutely depend? Bear in mind that no one who is not thoroughly trustworthy is to be let into the secret. All right, sir. You trust me for that, answered Dickinson. For my own sake, letting alone yours and the ladies, you may depend on it, I won't let out the secret to the wrong people. Well, let me just reckon up how many of us there'll be in all. Firstly, there's eight of you, counting in Mr. Bowles and Kit, and leaving out the ladies. Then there's the three other lads, and the four men as was brought in with you. That's seven. Seven and eights. Fifteen, interjected the skipper. Thank you, sir. I ain't much of a hand at figures myself. But in course you're right. Fifteen it is, said Dickinson. Then there's me and Tom Poole, that's my particular mate, promoted he is to the armorer's berth, 
and Dick Sullivan and Ned Masters, that's four more, making 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19, ain't it, sir? Quite right, answered Captain Staunton. Then there's the prisoners, as we calls them. Men, you know, sir, as has been took out of ships and wouldn't join the Brotherhood. I won't say much about them just yet, but there's about half a dozen very likely hands among them that I think'll just jump at the chance of getting out of this. Tom and me'll sound em cautious like and hear what they've got to say for themselves. Very well, said Captain Staunton. And in the meantime, it seems that there are nineteen of us all told who are to be absolutely relied upon. Quite enough to handle the schooner if we can only manage to get away with her. Now, what we have to do is this. The ballast and the water tanks are already fixed in their places, so that need not trouble us. But we must contrive to get the tanks filled as early as possible. Then, as soon as the decks are laid, we must get conveyed on board all the provisions we can possibly manage. Then we shall want arms and ammunition. The guns, too, must be hoisted in, under the pretense of fitting the slides properly. The spars are already commenced. They, or at least the lower masts and bowsprit, must be stepped before the craft is launched. That can easily be managed, I think. The other spars also should be finished and got on board as early as possible, and likewise the sails. There are the stores of every kind also to be got on board. In short, I should like to have the craft in a state of readiness to go to sea directly she leaves the stocks. But I really don't see how it is to be managed. We shall never be able to do a quarter of what we want without arousing Raleigh's suspicions. Oh, bless you, sir. Yes, you will, said Dickinson confidently. Raleigh's taken a mortal dislike to you all, and especially to Mr. Evelyn. Sorry I am to say so. And he just hates to be dictated to. Now, whatever you want, just let Mr. Evelyn tell him he ought to do the opposite of it. And, take my word for it, he'll just go and do exactly what he thinks you don't want him to. He'll do it out of sheer contrariness. But, whether or no, now that we knows what's wanted, we, that's me and my mates, will do as much of it as we can, and you'll have to manage rallies so as to get the rest. Very well, Dickinson, said the skipper. We understand each other fully now so I will not detain you any longer. Do what you can to forward the plan, and let us know from time to time what success you are meeting with. All right, sir. I will. Thank you, sir. Good night, ladies and gentlemen all. And Dickinson, taking the hint, retired. The gentlemen sat for an hour or two after that, talking over matters as they smoked their pipes, and then Captain Staunton, Lance, and Bowles rose and left the cottage to pay a visit to the cavern. In due time they reached the place, proceeding at once to the chasm where they forthwith commenced a vigorous but unsuccessful search for the origin of the mysterious sounds which had disturbed the ladies. Finding nothing, they began their task of conveying the gold collected that day across to the heap on the other side of the gulf. This heap was now assuming goodly proportions. There was more of it than an ordinary ship's boat could take at a single trip, even in the calmest of weather and Lance was in the act of remarking to Captain Staunton that he thought enough had now been collected to satisfy their every want, when a weird, unearthly moan smote upon their ears from the depths of the abyss. The sound, though not particularly loud, was so startling, echoing and reverberating as it did among the cavernous recesses far below, that the work was brought to a sudden standstill, and the three bewildered men felt their hair bristling as they listened. "'What, in heaven's name, can it be?' ejaculated the skipper, as he turned his startled gaze upon Lance. "'Impossible to say,' answered the latter. "'One thing, however, is certain. No human lungs could possibly give utterance to such a sound. And yet I don't know. The echoes of this place may have the property of magnifying and prolonging it. "'Hello there! Is there anyone below?' he continued, raising his torch aloft, and peering with craned neck down into the black depths of the chasm." There was no response, and the light of the torch was quite inadequate to the illumination of more than a few feet from the surface. It is possible that, if there is anyone down there, he may be unable to hear me. Sound rises, you know. Here, Bowles, come across to this side. We will unite our voices and see if that will evoke any response, said Lance. Bowles scrambled nimbly along the narrow and dangerous pathway, which, having traversed it so often, now had no terrors for any of them, and speedily joined the others. Now, said Lance, I will count three, and then we will all shout together hello. One, 
two, three. Hello! The cry went peeling away right and left of them along the dark gallery. The echoes taking it up and tossing it wildly from side to side, up and down, until it seemed as though every rock in the vast cavern had found a voice with which to mock them. But no answering cry came from below. There is no one there, said Lance. Indeed, there can be no one there. Nobody has been missed, and... Hark! What was that? A long, drawn, sobbing sigh, such as a child will utter after it has cried itself to sleep, but very much louder, and immediately afterwards a gust of hot air, which brought with it a distinct odor of sulfur, swept past them down the gallery. "'God of mercy! Can it be possible?' ejaculated Lance. "'Yes, it must be. Fly for your lives. We may not have a moment to lose.' "'What is it?' gasped Captain Staunton, as the three started at a run up the gallery in the direction of the great cavern. "'A volcano!' answered Lance. "'There are subterranean fires in activity at no great depth beneath our feet, and they may break into open eruption at any moment.' This was enough. His companions wanted to hear no more. The few words they had already heard lent wings to their feet, and in an incredibly short time they found themselves panting and exhausted with their unwanted exertions, once more in the open air. Now we are comparatively safe, said Lance, as they walked rapidly down the ravine. What I chiefly feared was one of those earthquake shocks such as sometimes precede a volcanic eruption. A comparatively insignificant one might have proved sufficient to cause the walls of the cavern to collapse and bury us. Of course the ladies must be cautioned not to venture near the place again, but I think perhaps it will be better not to tell them why. It will only alarm them, perhaps unnecessarily, and keep them on the tiptoe of nervous, anxious expectancy. The better plan will be to say that we consider we have now as much gold as we think it probable we shall be able to take away. Don't you think so, Staunton? Assuredly I do, answered the skipper emphatically. Why, I would not allow my wife to enter that cavern again for all the gold it contains. They reached the cottage without further adventure, and on the following morning the ladies were told by Captain Staunton that, sufficient gold having now been collected, there would be no further necessity for them to continue their visits to the cavern, which, moreover, Mr. Evelyn considered unsafe, the peculiar noises which had startled them all being, in his opinion, an indication of its liability to collapse at any moment. After this, a month passed away unmarked by anything worthy of record, except the ever-increasing insolence and tyranny of rally toward our unfortunate friends. The battery was by this time complete, the guns mounted, and the ammunition stored in its magazine, whilst the schooner was also in a very forward state. She was fully planked, decks laid, the ballast stowed, bulwarks and hatchways completed, her bottom coppered up to the load water line, her hull outside painted with a coat of priming, and the carpenters, assisted by the handiest men they could pick out, were busy finishing off the fittings of the cabin and forecastle. Lance had been anxiously watching for a favorable opportunity to put into operation Dickinson's suggestion as to the mode in which rally should be approached, in order to secure the completion of the work in the manner most favorable to their own plans. But hitherto no such opportunity had presented itself. This was peculiarly unfortunate, as the work was now in so forward a state that, whenever rally opened his mouth, he expected to hear the dreaded order given for the preparation of the ways and the construction of the cradle for launching. But at length the coveted opportunity came. It was about nine o'clock in the morning when Lance saw Rally step out of his gig onto the rocky platform at the lower end of the shipyard and walk straight toward the schooner. The Greek paused at a little distance from where Lance was at work, taking up a position from which he could obtain a favorable view of the vessel's beautifully modeled hull and gracefully sweeping lines. And then, with one eye shut, he began a critical scrutiny of her, shifting his position a few inches occasionally in order to test the perfection of the various curves. Now, Lance thought, is my time. I must tackle him at once, whatever comes of it. It will never do to defer the matter any further. Another hour's delay may upset all our plans. So throwing down his tools, he stepped up to Rally and said, I want to speak to you about the launch. We have now done nearly all that we can do to the schooner, while she remains on the stocks. And our next job will be to lay down the ways, and... Raleigh turned suddenly upon him with an evil gleam and glitter in his eyes, which spoke volumes as to the envy and hatred he bore to this man, who, though a prisoner and practically a slave, still revealed in every word and gesture 
his vast and unmistakable superiority to every other man on the island, its ruler included. Aha! Mr. Soldier, he said, using the mode of address which, for some reason known only to himself, he deemed most offensive to Lance, his lips curling into a sneering smile as he spoke. What are you doing away from your work? Go back to it at once, unless you wish me to start you with a rope's end, as I would an unruly boy. I have no work to go back to, said Lance. I am simply wasting my time at present, and I wanted to learn your wishes as to what is to be done next. I presume you will have the craft launched forthwith, as she is now ready to take to the water, and I should be glad to know what timber we are to use for the ways. You presume I will have the craft launched at once, repeated Raleigh, the spirit of opposition rising strong within him, and the sneer upon his lips growing more bitter with every word he uttered. Why should you presume any such thing, eh, you, sir? Because it is the right and proper thing to do, answered Lance. Every lover knows that a ship is launched before she is rigged. Besides, if you were to decide upon having the spars stepped and rigged, the stores stowed and the guns hoisted in before she leaves the stocks, I should have a lot of extra trouble in calculating the proper distribution of the weights so as to ensure her being in proper trim when she takes to the water, and I want to avoid all that if possible. The Greek grinned with vindictive delight as he listened to this apparently inadvertent admission on Lance's part. It revealed to him, as he thought, a new and unexpected method of inflicting annoyance upon this man whom he hated so thoroughly, and his eyes fairly sparkled with malice as he answered, "'What do you suppose I care about your extra trouble, you lazy skulking hound? I tell you this, I will have every spar stepped, rigged, and put in its place, the running rigging all rove, every sail bent, every gun mounted, the magazine stowed, the stores and water all put on board, and everything ready for the schooner to go straight out to sea from the stocks before she leaves them. Poole, Dickinson, to the two chums who are working at no great distance. Come here and listen to what I say. This stupid fellow, this soldier who thinks himself a sailor, says that the schooner ought to be launched at once. I say that she will be finished ready for sea before she leaves the stocks, and I place you, Dickinson, in charge of the work to see that my orders are obeyed. This fellow will no longer give any orders. He will be only a common workman. He will obey you in future, or you will freshen his way with a rope's end. You understand? Aye, aye, answered Dickinson. I understand your rally, and I'll do it too, never fear, with a scowl at Lance for Raleigh's benefit. Why, the man must be a fool, a perfect fool, not to see as it'd be ever so much easier to get things aboard now than when she's afloat. Now, you, turning to Lance, you just top your broom and get away back to your work at once, and don't let me see no more skulking, or you'd better look out. Lance simply shrugged his shoulders, as was his habit whenever he received any insolence from the members of the Brotherhood, and, turning on his heel, walked back to his work, secretly exulting in the complete success of his maneuver. Dickinson looked after him contemptuously for a moment or two, and then, his face clouding, he remarked, Arter all, I wish I hadn't spoke quite so rough to him. The chap's got his head screwed on the right way. He knows a mortal sight of things as I don't understand, and I'd have been glad to have had his help and advice like in many a little job, as I'm afeard we'll make a bit of a bungle of without him. That is all right, said Raleigh. You shall be able to talk him over, Dickinson. Be a bit civil to him, and he will tell you all that you will want to know. Leave the, what you call, the bullying to me. I shall take the care that he enough has of that. And now on that same morning, and only an hour or two after the conversation just recorded, there occurred an unfortunate incident which completely dissipated Lance's exultation, filling him with the direst and most anxious forebodings, and threatening to utterly upset the success of all their carefully arranged plans. It happened thus. Some timber was required by the carpenters on board the schooner, and Dickinson, eager to properly play his part in the presence of the Greek, who was standing close by, ordered Lance and Captain Staunton to bring up a large and heavy plank, which he pointed out. They accordingly shouldered it, and, staggering under the load, proceeded upon their way, which led them close past the spot where Raleigh stood. As they were passing him, it unfortunately happened that Lance stepped upon a small spar, which, rolling under his feet, caused him to stagger in such a way that the plank struck Raleigh full in the mouth knocking away three or four teeth and cutting open both lips. The fellow reeled backwards with the severity of the blow, but, recovering himself, whipped out his long knife and, 
pale as death with passion, rushed upon Lance. Captain Staunton saw what was about to happen, and shouted in warning, "'Look out, Evelyn!' flinging the plank to the ground at the same instant in such a way as to momentarily check the rush of the Greek. Lance, at the call, turned round and was just in time to save himself from an ugly blow by catching Raleigh's uplifted arm in his left hand. The pirate, lithe and supple as a serpent, writhed and twisted in Lance's grasp in his efforts to get free. But it was all in vain. He was helpless as a child in the iron grasp of the stalwart soldier, and he was at length compelled to fling his knife to the ground and own himself vanquished. But no sooner was he once more free than, calling to his aid a dozen of the most ruffianly of his band, he ordered them to seize Lance and the skipper and to lash them hand and foot until the irons could be brought and riveted on. This was done, and an hour afterwards, to the grief and consternation of all concerned in the plan of escape, the two to whom they chiefly looked for its success were marched off to the black hole, each man's ankles being connected together by a couple of close-fitting iron bands and two long fetter links. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bob Gives Way to Violence Great was the consternation and distress at Staunton Cottage that night when the workers returned from the shipyard and reported the arrest and imprisonment of Captain Staunton and Lance Evelyn. That these two should be placed in Durance at all was regarded as a serious misfortune, but coming as it did at so critical a time, just as the work on the schooner was drawing near its completion, and when the long-looked-for opportunity to escape might present itself at almost any moment, it was justly regarded as a disaster of the gravest character. The imprisoned men were the two who had most completely retained their coolness and self-possession throughout the whole of the reverses which had befallen the party. It was their fertile brains which had devised the audaciously daring plan of escape, and without them the rest of the party felt that they dare not do anything for fear of marring the whole scheme. And there was still another misfortune attending this arrest. Supposing a favorable opportunity presented itself for the carrying out of the plan, it could not be seized so long as these two men were prisoners. All, even to Dale, were fully agreed that escape without them was not to be thought of for a moment. For two of the party, poor Mrs. Staunton and Blanche, there was still another source of anxiety. Now that Raleigh had at last completely laid aside the mask of friendliness, which had at first concealed his feeling of ill will, now that he had cast off the last remains of a semblance of forbearance, to what terrible lengths might he not allow his vindictiveness to carry him? Would he stop short at the humiliation of imprisonment and fetters? Or was it not too greatly to be dreaded that he would now proceed also to active violence? This fear was fully shared by the rest of the party, but they were careful to hide it from the two poor heartbroken women who were chiefly interested in the prisoners, striving rather to inspire them with hopes which they themselves did not entertain. A long and most anxious discussion of the situation that night, Rex and Bowles taking the lead by virtue of their superior resolution and experience, was productive of absolutely no result except to place an additional damper upon their already sufficiently depressed spirits. Bob said nothing, but, like the Queen's parrot, he thought the more. Brooke frankly acknowledged himself quite unequal to the emergency, as did Dale, but both cheerfully stated their readiness to do anything they might be directed to do. And here it may be stated that misfortune had been gradually doing for the latter, as it does for so many people, what prosperity had utterly failed to do. It had been driving out of him that peevishness of temper and that utter selfishness of character which had been his most disagreeable characteristics, and it had developed in their place an almost cheerful resignation to circumstances and a readiness to think and act for others, which promised to make of him eventually a man whom it would be possible to both respect and esteem. The following day brought with it a full revelation of the state of things which our friends would have to expect in the future. Captain Staunton and Lance being taken out of their confinement only to be employed all day in fetters upon work of the most laborious description, and locked up again at night in the loathsome black hole, while for the benefit of the whole party, and for the rest of the prisoners also, for that matter, Raleigh had provided himself with a colt, 
which he applied with merciless severity to their shoulders whenever the humor seized him. This last indignity was almost greater than they could bear, but Lance saw that the time was not yet ripe for action, and that there was really nothing for it but to bear everything in dignified silence at present, and with as much fortitude as they could summon to their aid, and he managed to whisper as much to Bob, and to request him to pass the word to the others, which at intervals during the day Bob did. Before the day was over, most of the prisoners, excepting those belonging to the Galatea party, had had enough of Raleigh's cult, and signified their readiness to join the Brotherhood. They were accordingly sworn in at nightfall on their return from work. This most unfortunate state of affairs had prevailed for nearly a fortnight, during which Raleigh's arrangements for the entire completion of the schooner, whilst yet upon the stocks, had been pressed vigorously forward, when Dickinson found himself in a position to announce to the Greek that another three days would see the schooner ready for sea, and that, a sufficient number of men being now at liberty to proceed with the work, the time had arrived for the laying down of the ways and the construction of the cradle. The eyes of the Greek sparkled with delight. Three days, only three days more, or four at most, and the time for which he had so anxiously waited would have arrived, the time when he would find himself master not only of a battery which would enable him to hold the island against all comers, Johnson included, or rather, Johnson especially, but also of a smart little craft capable of sailing round and round the albatross, and heavily enough armed to meet her upon equal terms. Let but those three or four days pass without interruption, and with what sincere delight would he view the approach of Johnson and his brig, and with what a warm and unexpected welcome would he receive them. He rubbed his hands with fiendish glee as he thought of this, and slapped Dickinson playfully on the shoulder as he bid him commence the necessary work forthwith. Thereupon Dickinson boldly stated that he must have the advice and assistance of Captain Staunton and Lance, as he didn't know enough about cradles and ways and such like to build them properly, and he couldn't find anybody on the island as did. The ex-boson's mate was in hopes that this proposition of his would lead to at least a temporary amelioration of the condition of his two friends, if not the absolute establishment of a better state of things, but his hopes were unexpectedly and effectually quenched by the announcement that the Greek knew all about it, and intended to superintend that part of the work himself. The time had now arrived when a definite plan of action at the decisive moment ought to be fully agreed upon, and feeling this, Dickinson arose from his bunk about midnight that night, and lighting his pipe, sauntered in the direction of the black hole, hoping for an opportunity to confer and finally arrange matters with the prisoners confined therein. To his great disappointment and chagrin, he found the door of the place, a small, low building, roughly but very solidly constructed of stone, with no windows and no means of ventilation, save such as was afforded by the momentary opening of the door for ingress or egress, guarded by a couple of the most ruffianly of the pirates, fellows who were completely the creatures of Raleigh, and who had on more than one occasion thrown out strong hints of their suspicion that Dickinson was on more friendly terms than he ought to be with the men now in confinement. To their searching inquiries as to the reasons for Dickinson's untimely and suspicious visit to them, the ex boson's mate was driven to reply with a complaint as to the extreme heat and closeness of the night, and of his inability to sleep in consequence, his restlessness being such as to constrain him to rise and come outside for a smoke and a chat with somebody, and there being no one else to chat with, he had just come to them. To this explanation he added a careless offer to relieve them of their guard for the rest of the night, but this offer provoked such an expression of unqualified suspicion from both the guards that he at once saw he was treading on very dangerous ground, and was accordingly fain to abandon his well-intentioned effort to communicate with those inside the prison door. Driven thus into a corner, he resolved to get a word or two, if possible, with the inmates of Staunton Cottage, and he accordingly sauntered off, taking a very roundabout way, as long as he thought it at all possible for his movements to be seen by the already suspicious guards. Dickinson's complaint as to the heat and closeness of the night was quite sufficiently well-founded to have been accepted as perfectly genuine. It was pitchy dark, the sky being obscured by a thin veil of cloud, which was yet sufficiently dense to completely obscure the light of the stars. The air was still to the extent of stagnation, and the temperature was so unusually high that Dickinson found the mere act of walking even at the idle sauntering pace which he had adopted, a laborious exertion. In the great and oppressive stillness which prevailed, 
the hoarse thunder of the trampling surf upon the rocky shores of the island smote so loudly upon the ear as to be almost startling. And to the lonely wanderer, there in the stifling darkness, the sound seemed to bring a vague, mysterious premonition of disaster. Dickinson had almost reached the cottage when he became conscious of another sound rising above that of the roaring surf, the sound as of a heavily laden wagon approaching over a rough and stony road, or of a heavy train rumbling through a tunnel at no great depth beneath the surface of the earth. The sound, dull and muffled still, swept rapidly toward him from seaward, and at the moment of its greatest intensity there was for an instant a vibrating jar of the ground beneath his feet. The next moment it had passed, and the sound swept onward toward the interior of the island, until it again became lost in the hollow roar of the distant breakers. Somewhat startled by this singular and unusual phenomenon, Dickinson hurried forward, and soon stood beneath the walls of the cottage. A light was still burning in one of the upper rooms, so seizing a handful of fine gravel, he flung it against the window in the hope of quietly attracting the attention of the inmates. After two or three essays, his efforts were rewarded with success, the window being softly opened and Bowles's head thrust out, with the low-spoken ejaculation, "'Hello, below there!' "'It's me, Dickinson,' was the equally low-spoken response. "'If you're not all turned in, I'd be glad to have a few words with some of you.' "'All right, my lad,' said Bowles. "'I'll be down in a jiffy. Nothing else gone wrong, I hope?' "'No,' said Dickinson. "'I only wants to make a few arrangements. That's all.' In another minute the latter was cautiously lowered, and Rex and Bowles joined their visitor. "'I say, gentlemen, did you hear anything peculiar a few minutes ago?' was Dickinson's first remark. "'Yes,' said Rex. "'Did you? Unless I am greatly mistaken, we have been visited by a slight shock of earthquake.' "'Earthquake, eh? Well, if taint nothing worse than that, I don't mind,' was the response. "'You see, I don't know much about earthquakes, not being used to them, and I felt a bit scared just at first, I own. But if so be as it's only a earthquake, why, that's all right.' If anything like that happens, I like to know, if it's only to keep my mind quiet. But that ain't what I've come up here to rouse you gentlemen out in the middle watch about. It's just this here. And therewith he proceeded to lay before his hearers his own view of the state of affairs, pointing out to them the fact, already keenly recognized by them, that the moment for action might now present itself at any time, and explaining his own anxiety for a definite arrangement of some plan of operations, together with an agreement upon certain preconcerted signals to be of such a character as should be easily understood by the initiated, while unlikely to arouse the suspicions of the rest. A long conference ensued, at the close of which Dickinson quietly returned to his hammock, with the greatly relieved mind. The others also retired, but not to sleep. They felt that the decisive moment was at hand, the moment upon the right use of which depended their liberty, if not their lives, for they were fully persuaded that if their first attempt failed, they would never be allowed to have another, and, though still anxious, their recent talk with Dickinson had made them more hopeful of success than they had ever felt before. Hitherto they had always been haunted by a lurking doubt, but now they began for the first time to think that there really was a fair prospect of succeeding if they faced the dangers and difficulties of the attempt with boldness and resolution. Their chief anxiety now was how to free their two comrades, and to this they were as yet quite unable to see their way. Their anxiety and distress were greatly increased on the following day by finding that Raleigh had given orders that his two prisoners, the skipper and Lance, were henceforth to be kept in close confinement altogether, with a double guard fully armed at the door, instead of being released during the day to work with the others at the shipyard. To be confined at all in the noisome black hole was bad enough, and their fortnight's incarceration had already told visibly on the health of the prisoners, even when they had had the opportunity of breathing a pure atmosphere during the day. But now that they were doomed to remain in the place both day and night, their friends became seriously alarmed. They felt that the sentence was tantamount to one of a slow but certain death. And the most trying part of it was that there seemed no possibility of affording any succor to the doomed men. No attempt to help or relieve them could be devised except such as must necessarily bring the party into immediate collision with Raleigh and his myrmidons. The Greek had now entirely laid aside all pretense of treating his prisoners with any show of consideration. They had served his purpose. He had made them his tools as long as their assistance had been necessary to the advancement of his ambitious schemes. But now their help was no longer necessary to him, 
and he felt free to gratify, without stint, the malignant and vindictive feeling with which he had from the first regarded them. One or two of them, too, notably Lance and Captain Staunton, had on more than one occasion successfully opposed him in his efforts to have things entirely his own way, and that also must be amply atoned for. So he now amused himself at intervals in devising fresh indignities, in planning new hardships to be heaped upon the unfortunate Galatea party. It was in this vindictive spirit that, on the second evening after Dickinson's midnight visit, Raleigh walked up to the cottage and, unceremoniously opening the door, obtruded his unexpected and most unwelcome presence upon its inmates. As he made his appearance, the conversation, which had been of a somewhat animated character, suddenly ceased. He noted this circumstance as he glanced suspiciously round the room, with his features twisted into the now too familiar malicious smile. Bowing with a sarcastic affectation of politeness, he remarked, I am afraid my sudden appearance has interrupted a very interesting conversation. If so, I am very sorry. But pray go on. Do not allow my presence to be any, what you call it, any, any, ah, yes, I have it, any restraint. Then suddenly changing his manner as his naturally suspicious nature asserted itself, he demanded, What were you talking about? Tell me, you, I insist. We were talking about matters chiefly interesting to ourselves, answered Bowles. If it had been anything we wanted you to know, we'd have sent for you. Ha, my big strong friend, how you are funny tonight. You want to make a laugh at me, is it not? All right, wait till tomorrow. I then shall make a laugh at you. It is I that shall be funny then, returned Raleigh, with the evil smile broadening on his face and his eyes beginning to sparkle with anger. Well, he continued, since you will not so civil be as answer my polite question, I will tell you what I have come to say. It is this. You men are working, after a very lazy fashion it is the truth, for your living. And from now I intend that the women, oh, I beg the pardon, I should have said the ladies, shall work for theirs too. I am not any more going to allow laziness. You must all work, beginning tomorrow. Here was an announcement which fairly took away the breath of the party. Raleigh saw the consternation which his speech had produced, and laughed in hearty enjoyment of it. "'I tell you what it is, my good sir,' said Rex, recovering his presence of mind. "'You may say what you please as to the manner in which we work, but you know as well as I do that our services are ample payment for the food and lodging which we and the ladies get. And as to their working, why, it is simply preposterous. What can they do?' "'What can they do?' repeated Raleigh. "'Ha! Ha!' I will tell you, my very dear sir, what they can do, and what they shall do. There are three of them, and the one child. One shall do the cooking for the men, one shall clean out the sleeping room, repair the men's clothes, and make their hammocks, and one, the prettiest one, shall cook for me and keep my cabin in order, make and mend my clothes, and attend to me generally. As for the child, she shall gather firewood, and, ah, there she is, Come and kiss me, you little girl. May had, in fact, at that moment, entered the room with a happy laugh. But catching sight of Raleigh, the laugh was broken off short, and she sought shelter and safety by her mother's side, from which she manifested a very decided disinclination to move at Raleigh's invitation. Come here and kiss me, little girl, repeated the Greek, his anger rapidly rising as he saw how unmistakably the child shrank from him. "'You must please excuse her,' said Mrs. Staunton, with difficulty restraining the expression of her resentment. "'The child has not been accustomed to kiss strangers.' "'Come and kiss me, little girl,' repeated Raleigh for the third time, holding out his arms to May, and entirely ignoring Mrs. Staunton's remark. But his sardonic smile and his glittering eyes were the reverse of attractive to the child. Besides, she knew him. "'No,' she said resolutely. "'I will not kiss you. I don't love you.' You are the naughty, wicked, cruel man that locked up my dear papa and Mr. Evelyn, and won't let them come home to me. Hush, May darling, began Mrs. Staunton, but her warning came too late. The unlucky words had been spoken, and Raleigh, smarting under a sense of humiliation from the scorn and loathing of him so freely displayed by this pretty child, scarcely more than a baby yet, sprang to his feet, and seizing May roughly by the arm, dragged her with brutal force away from her mother's side and before anyone could interfere, drew out his colt and struck her savagely with it twice across her poor, little, lightly-clad shoulders. 
the little creature shrieked aloud with the cruel pain as she writhed in the ruffingly grasp of the pirate. Yet the fiendish heart of her tormentor felt no mercy. His lust of cruelty was aroused, and the colt was raised a third time to strike. But the blow never fell. Bob was the nearest to the pirate when he made his unexpected attack upon May, and though the occurrence was too sudden to admit of his interfering in time to prevent the first two blows, he was on hand by the time that the third was ready to fall. With a yell of rage more like that of a wild beast than of a man, he sprang upon Raleigh, dealing him with his clenched left hand so terrific a blow under the chin that the pirate's lower jaw was shattered, and his tongue cut almost in two. Then, quick as a flash of light, he released poor May from the villain's grasp, wrenched the colt out of his hand, and, whilst the wretch still writhed in agony upon the ground where he had fallen under the force of Bob's first fearful blow, thrashed him with it until the clothes were cut from his back, and his shoulders barred with a close network of livid and bloody wheels. The miserable cowardly wretch screamed at first more piercingly even than poor May had done, but Bob commanded silence so imperatively and with such frightful threats that Raleigh was fairly cowed into submitting to the rest of his fearful punishment in silence, save for such low moans as he was utterly unable to suppress. As may well be supposed, this startlingly sudden scene of violence was productive of the utmost confusion in the room where it originated. The ladies, hastily seizing poor little moaning May in their arms, beat a precipitate retreat, while the men sprang to their feet and tried, for some time in vain, to drag Bob away from his victim. But the lad was now a tall, stalwart, broad-shouldered fellow. His anger was thoroughly roused by the Greek's cruel and cowardly conduct, and it was not until he had pretty well exhausted himself in the infliction of a well-deserved punishment that he suffered himself to be dragged away. And it was now, too, in the desperate emergency with which our friends found themselves in a moment brought face to face, that Bob showed the sterling stuff of which he was made. Cutting short the horrified remonstrances of his friends, he took the reins of affairs in his own hands, issuing his instructions as coolly as though he had been a leader all the days of his life. "'The time has come,' said he. "'Mr. Bowles, get a piece of rope, lash that fellow hands and heels together, and gag him. The rest of you get our few traps together, tell the ladies to do the same, and let all muster down at the landing as quickly as possible. I'm off to warn Dickinson and the rest, and to release the captain and Mr. Evelyn.' Ah, I may as well take these, as his eye fell upon a brace of revolvers in Raleigh's belt. He withdrew the weapons, hastily examined them by the light of the lamp to ascertain whether they were loaded or no, found that they were, and then, repeating his injunctions as to rapidity of action, he slipped the pistols one into each pocket, opened the door, and disappeared in the darkness. Once fairly clear of the house, Bob paused for a minute or two to collect his thoughts. Then he walked on again toward the large building in which the men were housed, and on reaching it coolly thrust his head in at the open door and looked round as though in search of someone. "'Well, matey, what is it?' asked one of the pirates. "'Is Dickinson here?' inquired Bob boldly. "'I think he is,' was the reply. "'Yes, there he is, over there. "'Here, Dickinson, you're wanted.' "'Aye, aye,' answered Dickinson. "'Who wants me?' "'I do,' answered Bob. "'Mr. Raleigh says you're to shift over at once.' This was simply a form of words which had been agreed on when Dickinson paid his midnight visit to the cottage, and meant that the moment for action had arrived, and that a muster was to be made at the landing place. The sudden summons took Dickinson rather by surprise, though he had been schooling himself to expect it at any moment. He instantly recovered himself, however, and rising to his feet with a well-assumed air of reluctance, asked, "'Does he mean that we are to go now, tonight?' "'He said, at once,' answered Bob." "'Oh, very well,' growled Dickinson. "'I suppose we must obey orders. "'Here, you, Tom Poole, Sullivan, Masters,' "'and he glanced his eye round the room, "'apparently hesitating whom to choose, "'but gradually picking out, one after the other, "'all the men who had cast in their lot with our friends. "'Muster your kits, and then go up to the capstan house. "'You've got to turn in aboard the battery tonight, my beauties.' "'The men named, taking their cue from Dickinson, "'and acting up to instructions already received,' assumed a sulky, unwilling demeanor as they set about the work of packing a small quantity of already carefully selected clothes in their bags. Growling and grumbling at having to turn out just when they were thinking of tumbling into their hammocks, and so on, but using the utmost expedition all the same. In a little over ten minutes from the time of their first being called, 
the men, sixteen in number, stood in the large loft of the capstan house. Poole had brought with him the key of the arm chest, and, opening the case, he rapidly served out to every man a cutlass with its belt and a pair of six-chambered revolvers, every one of which he had himself fully loaded only the day before, in preparation for such an emergency as the present. The chest was then relocked and left, it being too heavy for them to carry away with them, to say nothing of the suspicion which such an act would excite if witnessed, as it would almost certainly be. But Poole slipped the key back into his pocket again, knowing that the strength of the chest and the solidity of the lock were such as to involve the expenditure of a considerable amount of time in the breaking open, and every minute of detention suffered by the pirates would now be almost worth a man's life to the escaping party. "'Now, lads,' said Dickinson, "'are you all ready? Then march, down to the beach we goes, and seizes the two whale-boats, eight of us to each boat, but mind, there's to be no getting into the boats or shoving off until the ladies and gentlemen from the huts all the here. Mayhap we shall have to make a fight of it on the beach yet, so keep dry land under your feet until you has orders contrary-wise.' The men descended the ladder, leading from the capstan house loft, and ranging themselves in a small compact body, two abreast, marched down to the landing place, being joined on their way by some half-dozen curious idlers who had turned out to see what was in the wind. Dickinson was most anxious to get rid of these unwelcome attendants, and did all he could think of to persuade them to return to the house, but though quite unsuspicious as yet, they were not to be persuaded. They preferred rather to march alongside the other party keeping up a constant fire of jests and witticisms as sailors are wont to indulge in. Bob, from a secluded and shadowy corner, watched this party as long as he could see them, and then began to look out for his own particular friends. He had not long to wait. Barely five minutes afterwards, he saw them also pass down on their way to the boats. He allowed these a sufficient time to reach the boats, and then set off at a brisk pace to the black hole. He soon reached it, and on his approach was promptly challenged by the two guards, who happened to be the same two truculent ruffians who were on guard when Dickinson tried to communicate with the prisoners. In reply to the challenge, Bob informed them that they were wanted by rally immediately at the cottage, that being the most distant building, and that he had orders to keep guard until their return. "'What are we wanted for?' was the suspicious question. "'Oh, I believe there's some more people to be locked up here,' answered Bob nonchalantly. All right, answered the one who had asked the question. Come on, Mike, and you, you young swab, mind you don't let a soul come near here while we're gone. If you do, Rally'll just skin yer, do you hear? All right, answered Bob, placing his back against the door. You go on. I won't give Rally a chance to skin me, never fear. He's a good deal more likely to skin you if you don't look sharp. The two guards accordingly set out in the direction of the cottage, but they had not gone half a dozen steps before they returned, cursing and swearing most horribly. "'Here, you young cub, what's the password? Damn me if I hadn't forgotten that!' exclaimed one of them, making towards Bob with outstretched hand. "'Stand back,' said Bob. "'If you advance another step, I'll shoot you both like dogs.' "'The password, the password,' demanded the ruffianly pair. "'Give the password at once, or by I'll split your skull with this cutlass.' Bob saw that he had not a moment to lose, that his life hung upon a thread, and that, moreover, if he allowed these fellows to overpower him, the whole scheme would probably fail. He therefore whipped out his pistols, and, taking rapid aim, pulled both triggers at the same instant. There was a single report, and one of the men staggered forward, shot through the body, whilst the other threw up his arms and fell back heavily to the ground, with a bullet in his brain. Bob remembered for many a long day afterwards, and often saw in his dreams at night the wild, despairing glare in the eyes of the dying pirate as the flash of the pistol glanced upon the glazing eyeballs for an instant. But he had no time to think about such things now. Stooping down and applying his mouth to the keyhole, he said, loud enough to be heard by those within, "'Stand clear in there. I'm about to blow the lock to pieces. It is I, Robert. The time has come.' "'Fire away, my lad,' was the reply. "'You will not hurt us.' Bob applied the muzzles of both pistols to the lock and pulled the triggers. Fortunately, the lock was not a particularly strong one, and a supplementary kick sent the door flying open. Captain Staunton and Lance at once emerged from their dark noise in prison and glanced eagerly around them. "'Thank you, Robert,' hurriedly exclaimed the skipper. "'There is no time to say more now, I know, 
So tell us what we are to do, my lad, and we'll do it. Bob pointed to the prostrate bodies of the two pirates and said, Take their arms, and then we must make a rush to the landing. This firing is sure to have raised an alarm, but it could not be helped. But how is this? Where are your manacles? Slip them off, my lad, the moment we heard your voice, answered the skipper. Price, fine fellow that he is, managed that for us by putting us in iron several sizes too large for us. Now, Evelyn, are you ready? I fancy I hear footsteps running this way. All ready, said Lance. Then off we go, exclaimed Bob. This way, gentlemen, sharp round to the right for a couple of hundred yards, then straight for the landing. It will give us a better chance if the pirates suspect anything and place themselves to cut us off. Away went the trio at racing pace, Bob slightly taking the lead and striking sharply away to the right. It was well for them that they did so, as they were thus unable to dodge a crowd of men who came excitedly running up from the landing on hearing the pistol shots. The party from the cottage had safely reached the boats some few minutes before this. Dickinson, having very cleverly got them through the crowd on the landing place, by calling out in an authoritative voice as soon as he saw them coming, "'Now then, lads, make way there, make way for the prisoners to pass.' The men accordingly gave way, forming a lane in their midst through which our friends passed in fear and trembling. Exposed for a minute or so to the coarsest rivalry which the ruffianly band could summon to their lips on the spur of the moment. It was not until they had all been passed safely into the two whale boats and Dickinson's little band had drawn themselves closely up with drawn cutlasses in a compact line between the boats and the shore that the suspicions of the pirates became in the least aroused. Then there gradually arose an eager whispering among them. Suspicious glances were turned first upon Dickinson's party and then toward the buildings and upon the noise of shots being heard, they all set out at a run in the direction of the sound, fully persuaded that affairs had somehow fallen out of joint with them, and that it was quite time for them to be stirring. They had run about half the distance between the boats and the capstan house when someone caught a glimpse of three flying figures indistinctly made out through the gloom. The alarm was instantly given, and in another moment the entire crowd had turned sharply off in pursuit. It now became a neck-and-neck -neck race between the two parties as to which should reach the boats first. The pirates were poor runners, not being much accustomed to that kind of exercise, but so unfortunately were two out of the three fugitives of whom they were in chase. Bob was fleet as a deer for a short distance, but he was far too loyal to leave his two friends, and they, poor fellows, weak and cramped as they were with their recent confinement, already began to feel their limbs dragging heavy as lead over the ground. The pirates gained upon them rapidly. Presently, one of the pursuers was so near that they could hear him panting heavily behind. "'You keep steadily on,' murmured Bob, as he pushed in for a moment between his two companions. "'I'll stop this fellow.' Then, allowing the skipper to pass ahead of him, he sprang suddenly aside, and, grasping one of his pistols by the barrel, brought down the butt of the weapon heavily upon the pirate's head as he rushed past. The fellow staggered a pace or two further and then fell heavily to the ground, where he lay face downwards and partially stunned until his comrades came to his assistance. As, fortunately, they all stopped and gathered round the man, raising him to his feet and eagerly questioning him, the diversion thus created gave the three fugitives time to reach the boats without further molestation. Here they were, of course, received with open arms, but before their greetings were half exchanged, the armed guard had turned to the boats, and, exerting their whole strength, shot them out upon the glassy waters of the bay, springing in themselves at the same moment, and taking to their oars without an instant's delay. As soon as the boats' heads were turned round and fairly pointed away from the shore and toward the shipyard, Dickinson, taking off his hat in salutation to Captain Staunton, said in a loud voice so that all in the boats could hear, "'Now, sir,' We're fairly launched upon this here enterprise at last, and may luck go with us. We've all had to manage as best we could for the last few days, since you was locked up, you know, sir. But now as you're free again, we want you to understand as we all looks upon you as our lawful leader and captain, and that from henceforth, all you've got to do is to give your orders, and we'll obey them. End of chapter 19《ャプター20》《パイレット・アイランド》《ストーリー・オブ・デ・サウス・パシフィック》《ヘリー・コリンウッド》《This LibriVox Recording is in the Public Domain》《A Night of Terror》Captain Staunton's first act, after suitably acknowledging Dickinson's expression of fealty, 
was to inquire how the crisis had been brought about. The explanation made his eyes flash fire. He ground his teeth and clenched his fists with rage as he thought of how he would have punished the ruffian who had laid such brutal hands upon his little pet. And when the explanation was complete, he wrung Bob's hand until it fairly ached as he thanked him for what he had done. Meanwhile, poor May still lay in her mother's arms, moaning with pain. And when the skipper took her on his knee, the little creature once more screamed out and complained that it hurt her shoulder. Upon this, Lance, thinking that something must be wrong, made a careful examination of the child, when it was found that Raleigh's brutal violence had resulted in the dislocation of her shoulder. It was, of course, at once pulled back into place, but the poor little creature's screams at the pain of the operation were terrible to hear, and Captain Staunton, in the hastiness of his anger, registered a solemn vow that if he ever again met Raleigh, he would make the wretch pay dearly for his brutality. How little he dreamed of the terrible circumstances under which he would next see this miserable man. The two whaleboats sped swiftly across the glassy surface of the bay, propelled by six stalwart oarsmen each, a little jet of phosphorescent water spouting up under their sharp stems, a long ripple spreading out and undulating away on either side of them, and half a dozen tiny whirlpools of liquid fire swirling in the wake of each as their crews strained at the stout ash oars until they bent again. The night had grown black as pitch. Not a solitary star was visible, and the heat was so intense as to be almost insufferable. But the men thought nothing of this in their eagerness and zeal now that they had taken the decisive step of throwing up their old life of crime and had fairly enrolled themselves once more on the side of law and order. In a very short time the boats had made the passage across the bay and were brought with an easy, graceful sweep alongside the landing at the shipyard. The occupants quickly disembarked, and while the ladies proceeded at once under the care and guidance of Rex and Bob to safe and comfortable quarters in the schooner's spacious cabin, Captain Staunton gave orders that two large fires should be immediately lighted, one on each side of the landing, for the double purpose of affording them a light to work by and of enabling them to perceive the approach of their enemies. For, he remarked to Lance, you may depend upon it that their suspicions are thoroughly aroused by this time, and it will not be long before they are after us to see what it all means. A couple of huge heaps of shavings, chips, and ends of timber were speedily collected and ignited, the blaze soaring high in the motionless air and throwing a strong, ruddy light for a considerable distance round. Then Lance, with Bowles, Dickinson, Poole, and three or four other reliable hands, armed with torches, went carefully round the schooner, inspecting the cradle. It was unfinished, but Lance thought that a couple of hours more of energetic labor expended upon it would make it sufficiently secure to enable them to effect the launch. Time was now of immense value to them. They could not afford to be very particular, and so long as the cradle would serve its purpose, that was all they cared about. They accordingly set to with a will, and very soon the yard resounded with the harsh rasping of saws and the heavy blows of mauls wedging the timbers into their places. In the meantime, Captain Staunton, with the rest of the party, went on board the schooner, and after fully arming themselves with cutlass and revolver, opened the magazine, passed a good supply of ammunition on deck, cast loose the guns, and carefully loaded them cramming them almost to the muzzle with bullets, spike nails, and anything else they could lay hold of. This done, the skipper, unwilling to leave the ship himself, called for a volunteer to go to the battery, spike the guns there, and lay a fuse in the magazine. Bob at once stepped forward, and, being accepted, provided himself forthwith with a hammer and a sufficient length of fuse, and set out upon his errand. He had scarcely disappeared in the gloom when Dale, who had volunteered to keep a lookout, gave warning of the approach of two boats, the launch and the pinnace, full of men. They were observed almost at the same moment by Lance, who hailed, "'Schooner ahoy! Do you see the boats coming?' "'Aye, aye,' answered Captain Staunton. "'We see them, and we'll give them a warm reception presently.' "'Very well,' returned Lance. "'We shall stick to our work and leave you to do the fighting.' If you require any assistance, give us a call. All right, answered the skipper. Then turning to the men on the schooner's deck, he shouted, Run those two guns out of the stern ports there, and train them so as to sweep the boats just before they reach the landing. So, that's well. 
Now wait for the word, and when I give it, fire. The boats, however, were meantime lying upon their oars, their crews apparently holding a consultation. The firelight which revealed their approach revealed to them also the fact that the occupants of the shipyard were fully prepared to emphatically dispute any attempt on their part to land, and the sight brought vividly to their minds the aphorism that discretion is the better part of valor. At length, after some twenty minutes of inaction, during which the workers underneath the schooner's bottom plied their tools with a skill and energy that was truly astounding, the two boats were once more put in motion, their crews directing their course toward the landing, each boat having a rude substitute for a white flag reared upon a boat hook in the bow. The moment that they were near enough for their occupants to hear him, Captain Staunton hailed them with an imperative order to keep off or he would fire into them. They at once laid upon their oars, and a man rising in the stern sheets of the launch returned an answer which was, however, quite unintelligible. Meanwhile, the boats, still having way upon them, continued slowly to approach. Backwater, shouted the skipper, seizing the trigger line of one of the guns, whilst Brooke stood manfully at the other. Backwater, all of you, instantly, or we will fire. The man in the stern sheets of the launch waved his hand. The oars again flashed into the water, and both boats dashed at the landing place. Wait just a moment yet, said the skipper, raising a warning hand to Brooke, and squinting along his gun at the same time. Now, fire! The report of the two brass nine-pounders rang sharply out at the same moment, making the schooner quiver to her keel and severely testing the construction of her cradle. A crash was heard, then a frightful chorus of shrieks, yells, groans, and execrations, and as the smoke curled heavily away, both boats were seen with their planking rent and penetrated here and there, and their occupants tumbling over and over each other in their anxiety to get at the oars, many of which had been suffered to drop overboard, and withdraw as quickly as possible to a somewhat safer distance. A hearty cheer was raised by the party in possession of the shipyard. Those on board the schooner reloaded their guns in all haste, and the hammering down below went on with, if possible, still greater energy. The boats were suffered to retire unmolested, and nothing further was heard of them for over half an hour. Then Dale, who was still maintaining a careful lookout, suddenly gave notice that they were again approaching. The two aftermost guns were accordingly once more very carefully pointed and fired, Captain Staunton giving the word as before. But by some mischance the muzzles were pointed a trifle too high, and both charges flew harmlessly over the boats, tearing up the water a few yards astern of them. The pirates, upon this unexpected piece of, to them, good fortune, raised a frantic cheer of delight, and bending at their oars until they seemed about to snap them, dashed eagerly at the landing place. There was no time to reload the guns, so, seizing his weapons and calling upon all hands to follow him, the skipper hastily scrambled over the schooner's bulwarks, and making his way to the ground, rushed forward to meet the enemy, who had by this time effected a landing. The two opposing forces met within half a dozen yards of the water's edge, and then ensued a most desperate and sanguinary struggle. The pirates had by this time pretty nearly guessed at the audacious designs of those to whom they were opposed. They had seen enough to know not only that an escape was meditated, but that it was also proposed to carry off the schooner, that beautiful craft which their own hands had so largely assisted to construct, and in which they had confidently expected to sail forth upon a career of unbounded plunder and license, in full reliance that her speed would ensure to them complete immunity from punishment for their nefarious deeds. Such unheard of audacity was more than enough to excite their anger to the pitch of frenzy and they fought like demons, not only for revenge, but also for the salvation of the schooner. But if these were the motives which spurred them on to the encounter, their adversaries were actuated by incentives of a still higher character. They fought for the life and liberty, not only of themselves, but also of the weak defenseless women, whose only trust under God was in them. And if the pirates rushed furiously to the onset, they were met with a cool, determined resolution, which was more than a balance for overpowering numbers. Captain Staunton looked eagerly among the crowd of ruffianly faces for that of Raleigh, determined to avenge with his own hand the multitudinous wrongs and insults which this man had heaped upon him and his dearest ones. But the Greek was nowhere to be seen. 
On the skipper's right was Lance, and on his left Dickinson, the former fully occupying the attention of at least three opponents by the marvelous play of his cutlass blade, whilst the latter brandished with terrible effect a heavy crowbar which he had hurriedly snatched up on being summoned to the fight. Rex and Brooke were both working wonders also. Bowles was fighting as only a true British seaman can fight in a good cause, and Dale, with a courage which excited his own most lively surprise, was handling his cutlass and pistol as though he had used the weapons all his life. Steadily, and inch by inch, the pirates were driven back in spite of their superior numbers, and at last, after a fight of some twenty minutes, they finally broke and fled before a determined charge of their adversaries, rushing headlong to their boats and leaving their dead and wounded behind them. Captain Staunton did not follow them up, although the two whaleboats still lay moored at the landing as they had left them. He was anxious to avail himself of the advantage already gained in making good the escape of his own party, rather than to risk further losses by an attempt to inflict additional punishment upon his adversaries. Besides, that might possibly follow later on, when they had got the schooner afloat. His first act, therefore, after the flight of the pirates, was to muster his forces and ascertain the extent of the casualties. The list was a heavy one. In the first place, nine of the little band were missing at the muster. Bowles presented himself with his left arm shattered by a pistol bullet. Brooke was suffering from a severe scalp wound, and every one of the others had a wound or contusion of some sort which, whilst it did not incapacitate them for work, was a voucher that they had not shrunk from taking their part manfully in the fight. This first hasty examination over, an anxious search was instituted for the missing. The first man found was Dickinson, dead, his body covered with wounds, and a bullet hole in the center of his forehead. Near him lay Dale, bleeding and insensible, shot through the body, and a little further on Bob was found, also insensible, with a cutlass gash across the forehead. Then Dick Sullivan was found dead, with his skull cloven to the eyes, and near him, also dead, one of the seamen of the Galatea. And lastly, at some distance from the others, Ned Masters, with another seaman from the Galatea, and two of the escaped prisoners, were found all close together, severely wounded, and surrounded by a perfect heap of dead and wounded pirates. These four, it seemed, had somehow become separated from the rest of their party, and had been surrounded by a band of pirates. This made a list of three killed and six severely wounded. The latter were gently raised in the arms of their less injured comrades and taken with all speed on board the schooner, where they were turned over for the present to the care of the ladies, while those who were still able to work resumed operations underneath the ship's bottom. Another quarter of an hour's hard work, and then Lance's voice was heard ordering one hand to jump on board the schooner and look out for a line. "'All right,' exclaimed Bob's voice from the deck. "'Heave it up here, Mr. Evelyn.' "'What? You there, Robert?' "'Glad to hear it, my fine fellow. "'Just go forward, look out for the line, "'and, when you have it, haul taut and make fast securely.' "'All right,' answered Bob with his head over the bows. "'Heave!' "'The line, a very slender one, was thrown up, "'and Bob, gathering in the slack, "'and noticing that it led from somewhere ahead of the schooner, "'bowsed it well taut and securely belayed it. "'He knew at once what it was. "'Hurrah!' he shouted joyously. "'That means that we are nearly ready for launching.' Bob's unexpected reappearance, it may be explained, was due to the fact that he had been merely stunned and had speedily recovered consciousness under the ministering hands of his gentle friends in the cabin, upon which, though his head ached most violently, he lost no time in returning to duty. Lance now made a second careful inspection of the cradle, and upon the completion of his round he pronounced that, though the structure was a somewhat rough and ready affair, it would do, that is to say, it would bear the weight of the schooner during the short time she was sliding off the ways, and that was all they wanted. "'And now comes the wedging up, I suppose, sir?' remarked Poole interrogatively. "'Wedging up?' returned Lance with a joyous laugh. "'No, thank you, Poole. We'll manage without that. Do you see these two pieces of wood here in each keel block? Well, they are wedges. You have only to draw them out, and the top of the block will be lowered sufficiently to allow the schooner to rest entirely in the cradle.' Get a maul, Poole, and you and I will start forward, whilst you, Kit, with another hand, commence aft. Knock out the wedges on both sides as you come to them, and work your way forward until you meet us. The rest of you had better go on board and see that everything is clear and ready for launching. 
When you're quite ready to launch, let me know, if you please, Mr. Evelyn, and I'll go and light the fuse that's to blow up the battery, said Bob. Ah, to be sure, answered Lance. I had forgotten that. You may go up now if you like, Bob, and I'll give you a call when we're ready. Bob thereupon set off on his mission of destruction, while Lance and Poole with a couple of mauls began to knock out the wedges which Evelyn, foreseen from the very inception of the work, some such emergency as the present, had introduced in the construction of the keel blocks. In a few minutes, both parties met near the middle of the vessel, and the last pair of wedges were knocked out. "'That's a good job well over,' exclaimed Poole, "'and precious glad I am now that I thought of soaping them ways this morning. I knowed this here business must come before long, and I determined to get as far ahead with the work as possible. Now I suppose, sir, we're all ready?' "'Yes, I think so,' answered Lance. "'But I'll just go forward and take a look along the keel to see that she is clear everywhere.' He accordingly did so, and had the gratification of seeing, by the still brilliant light of the fires, that the keel was a good six inches clear of the blocks, fore and aft. "'All clear,' he shouted. "'Now go on board, everybody. Light the fuse, Robert, and come on board as soon as possible.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' answered Bob, from the not very distant battery. A tiny spark of light appeared for an instant in the darkness, high up on the face of the rock, as our hero struck a match and in another couple of minutes he was running nimbly up the steep plank leading from the rocks beneath to the schooner's deck. "'Kick down that plank, Robert, my lad, and see that it falls clear of everything,' said Lance. "'Are we all clear fore and aft?' "'All clear, sir,' came the hearty reply from various parts of the deck. "'Are you ready with the axe forward there, Kit?' "'All ready, sir.' "'Then cut!' A dull, cheeping thud of the axe was immediately heard, accompanied by a sharp twang as the tautly strained line parted. Then followed the sound of the shores falling to the ground. There was a gentle jar, and the schooner began to move. "'She moves! She moves!' was the cry. "'Hurrah! Now she gathers way!' "'Yes!' shouted Lance joyously. "'She's going. Success to the petrol!' As he shivered to pieces on the stem head, a bottle of wine which the steward, anxious that the launch should be shorn of none of its honors, had brought up from the cabin and hastily thrust into his hand. Three cheers for the saucy petrol, my lads. Hip, 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 hurrah! The three cheers rang lustily out upon the still air of the breathless night as the schooner shot with rapidly increasing velocity down the ways and finally plunged into the mirror-like waters of the bay, dipping her stern deeply and plowing up a smooth, glassy furrow of water fringed at its outer edge with a coruscating border of vivid phosphorescent light. "'The boats! The boats again!' suddenly shouted Bowles, as the schooner, now fairly afloat, shot rapidly stern foremost away from the rock. "'Good God! They are right in our track! We shall cut them in two. "'That is their lookout,' grimly responded Captain Staunton. "'If they had been wise, they would have accepted their defeat and retired to the shore. "'As, however, they have not done so, they must take the consequences. "'Remember, lads, not a man of them must be suffered to come on board.' A warning shout from the helmsman of the pinnace announced his sudden discovery of the danger which threatened the boats, and he promptly jammed his helm hard a starboard. The launch was on his port side, and the result was a violent collision between the two boats, the pinnace striking the launch with such force as to send the latter clear of the schooner, whilst the pinnace herself, recoiling from the shock, stopped dead immediately under the schooner's stern. There was a sharp, sudden crash as the petrel's rudder clove its irresistible way through the doomed boat, and a yell of dismay from its occupants, several of whom made a spring at the schooner's taffrail, only to be remorselessly thrust off again. "'There is a chance for them yet,' said the skipper, as the schooner continued to drive astern, leaving the wretches struggling in the water. "'The launch has escaped. She can pick them up.' At length the schooner's way slackened sufficiently to enable Lance, by looking over the bow and stern, to ascertain her exact trim. "'It is perfect,' he exclaimed to Captain Staunton, as he rejoined the ladder near the companion. "'She sits accurately down to her proper waterline everywhere, thus proving the correctness of all my calculations. A result which pleases as much as it surprises me, since I have had to depend entirely on my memory for the necessary formula. "'Well, Captain Staunton, my task is now finished.' Here is the schooner, fully rigged and fairly afloat. Take charge of her, my dear sir, and may she fully answer all your expectations. Thanks, Evelyn, a thousand thanks, exclaimed the skipper, heartily grasping Lance's preferred hand. 
you have indeed executed your self-imposed task faithfully and well. Let me be the mouthpiece of all our party in conveying to you our most hearty expressions of gratitude for the noble manner in which you have aided us in our great strait. To you is entirely due the credit of bringing our project thus far to a successful issue, but for your skill, courage, and resolution, we might have been compelled to remain for years. Ha! What is that? A low rumbling roar was faintly heard in the distance, rapidly increasing in volume of sound, and breaking in with startling effect upon the breathless stillness of the night. It is another earthquake, exclaimed Lance. Thank heaven we are afloat. Had it caught us upon the stocks, it would doubtless have shaken the cradle to pieces, and, in all probability, thus frustrated our escape. The ominous sound drew swiftly nearer and nearer, filling the startled air with a chaos of sound which speedily became absolutely deafening in its intensity. The waters of the bay broke first into long lines of quivering ripples, then into a confused jumble of low foaming surges. The schooner jarred violently, as though she was being dragged rapidly over a rock bottom. There was a hideous groaning grinding sound on shore soon mingled with that of the crashing fall of enormous masses of earth and rock, above which could still be feebly heard the piercing shriek of horror raised by the occupants of the launch. The shock passed, but was immediately followed by one of still greater intensity. The waters were still more violently agitated. The schooner was swept helplessly hither and thither, rolling heavily and shipping great quantities of water upon her deck as the shapeless surges madly leaped and boiled and swirled around her. Finally, a long line of luminous foam was seen to be rushing rapidly down upon the schooner from the harbor's mouth, stretching completely across the bay. As it came near, it was apparent that this was the foaming crest of a wall of water some twelve feet in height, which was rushing down the bay at railway speed. "'Hold on, every one of you, for your lives!' hoarsely shouted the skipper, as the wave swept threateningly down upon the schooner, and the next moment it burst upon them with a savage roar. Luckily, the petrel's bows were presented fairly to it, or the consequences would have been disastrous. As it was, it curled in over the stem, an unbroken mass of water, filling the decks in an instant and carrying the schooner irresistibly along with it toward the shore at the bottom of the bay. "'Let go the anchor!' shouted Captain Staunton, as soon as he could get his head above water. But before this could be done, the wave had swept past, rushing with a loud, thundering roar far up the beach, even to the capstan house, and then rapidly subsiding. "'Get the canvas on her at once,' ordered Captain Staunton. "'Close reefed, mainsail, foresail, and jib. We shall have some wind presently, please God, and we'll make use of it to get out of this as speedily as possible. Merciful heaven, what now?' A sudden roar, a rattling crash, as of a peal of heaviest thunder, and the whole scene was suddenly lit up with a lurid ruddy glow. Turning their startled glances inland, our adventurers saw that the lofty hilltop, dominating the head of the ravine, near which was situated the gold cavern, had burst open and was vomiting forth vast volumes of flame and smoke. As they looked, the top of the hill visibly crumbled and melted away, the flames shot up in fiercer volumes, vast quantities of red-hot ashes, mingled with huge masses of glowing incandescent rock, were projected far into the air. A terrific storm of thunder and lightning suddenly burst forth to add new terrors to the scene, and to crown all, a new rift suddenly burst open in the side of the hill, out of which there immediately poured a perfect ocean of molten lava. In the face of this stupendous phenomenon, Captain Staunton's order to make sail passed unheeded. The entire faculties of every man on board the schooner were wholly absorbed in awestruck contemplation of the terrific spectacle. Onward rolled the fiery flood. It wound in a zigzag serpentine course down the side of the hill, and soon reached the thick wood at its base and at the head of the valley. The stately forest withered, blazed for a brief moment, and vanished in its fatal embrace, and now it came sweeping down the steep declivity toward the bay. This terrible sight aroused and vivified the paralyzed energies of those on board the petrel. Without waiting for a repetition of the order to make sail, they sprang with panic-stricken frantic haste to cast off the gaskets, and in an incredibly short time the schooner was under canvas. Still, there was no wind. Not the faintest breath of air came to stir the flapping sails of the now gently rolling vessel, and her crew could do nothing but wait in feverish, anxious expectancy 
for the long-delayed breeze, watching, meanwhile, the majestic, irresistible onward sweep of that fiery deluge. At last, thank God, there was a faint puff of wind. It came, sighed past, and died away. And now another. The sails caught it, bellied out, flapped again, filled once more, and the petrel gathered way. She had gradually swung round until her bow pointed straight for the capstan house, and Captain Staunton sprang to the wheel, sending it with a single vigorous spin hard over. The breeze was still very light, and the craft responded but slowly to her helm. But at length she came up fairly upon a wind and made a short stretch to the eastward, tacking the moment that she had gathered sufficient way to accomplish the maneuver. She was now on the port tack, stretching obliquely across the bay in a southerly direction, when a startled call from Poole, repeated by all the rest, directed Captain Staunton's gaze once more landward. "'Look! Look! Merciful powers! It is Raleigh!' was Lance's horrified exclamation, as he grasped the skipper convulsively by the shoulder, and pointed with a trembling hand to the shore. Sure enough, it was Raleigh. The pirates had either not waited to seek him, or had not thought of looking for him in the cottage before setting out on their expedition against the shipyard, and he had consequently been left there. But somehow, doubtless in the desperation of mortal fear excited by the dreadful phenomena in operation around him, he had at last succeeded in freeing himself from his bonds, and was now seen running toward the beach, screaming madly for help. The stream of lava was only a few yards behind him, and it had now spread out to the entire width of the very narrow valley. The unhappy wretch was flying for his life. Terror seemed to have endowed him with superhuman strength and speed, and for a moment it almost appeared as though he would come out a winner in the dreadful race. "'Bout ship!' sharply rang out the skipper's voice. "'He is a fiend rather than a man, but he must not perish thus horribly if we can save him.' He put the helm hard down as he spoke, and the schooner shot up into the wind, with her sails sluggishly flapping. But before she had time to get fairly round, the helm was suddenly righted and then put hard up. "'Keep all fast,' commanded Captain Staunton. "'It is too late. No mortal power can save him. See, he is already in the grasp of his fate.' Such was indeed the case. The fierce breath of that onward rolling flood of fire was upon him. Its scorching heat sapped his strength. He staggered and fell. With the rapidity of a lightning flash, he was up and away again, but, merciful God, see, his clothing is all ablaze, and listen to those dreadful shrieks of fear and agony. Ah, miserable wretch, now the flood itself is upon him. See how the waves of fire curl round him? He throws up his arms with a harsh, despairing, blood-curdling yell. He sinks, he is gone, and the surging, fiery river sweeps grandly on until it plunges with an awful hissing sound into the waters of the bay, and the whole scene becomes blotted out by the vast curtain of steam which shoots up and spreads itself abroad. "'What a night of horror! It is hell upon earth!' gasped the skipper, as he turns his eyes away and devotes himself once more solely to the task of navigating the schooner. "'Thank God the breeze is freshening, and we may now hope to be soon out of this and clear of it all. Phew! What terrific lightning! And what an infernal combination of deafening sounds!' Fortunate was it for the schooner and her crew that the wind was from the southward, or blowing directly down into the bay. Otherwise, they would speedily have been lost in the thick clouds of steam which rose from the water, or set on fire by the dense shower of red-hot ashes which now began to fall thickly about them. As it was, though the wind was against them, and they were compelled to beat up the bay, the wind kept back the steam, and also, to a great extent, the falling ashes, but notwithstanding these favorable circumstances, the crew were obliged to keep the decks deluged with water to prevent their being ignited. Gradually, however, the petrol drew further and further beyond the influence of this danger, and soon the rock at the harbor's mouth was sighted. Captain Staunton was at first somewhat anxious about risking the passage out to sea, being doubtful whether the explosion of the magazine had yet taken place, but a little reflection satisfied him that it must have occurred, as they had been drifting about the bay for nearly an hour, and he determined to push on. Suddenly there was a shout from the lookout forward. Boat ahead! Immediately followed by the information. It's the launch, sir. Bottom up. Such indeed it proved to be when the schooner a minute later glided past it. But where were her crew? They had disappeared, leaving no sign behind them. The hoarse, angry roar of the breakers outside was now distinctly audible 
and in another five minutes' time the petrel's helm was eased up. She was kept away a couple of points, and, shooting through the short narrow passage on the eastern side of the rock, began to plunge with a gentle swinging motion over the endless procession of long, slowly moving swell outside. The crew of the schooner had time to note, as they swept past the rock and through the passage, that the battery no longer frowned down upon the bay. In its place there appeared a yawning, fire-blackened chasm, and the shipyard was thickly strewed with masses and fragments of rocks of all sizes. Both whaleboats were swamped, and a solitary gun, with a fragment of its carriage still attached, lay half in and half out of the water. The timbers of the dismembered cradle still floated huddled together like a raft, close to the landing. Now, said Lance to Captain Staunton, as soon as they were fairly outside of the harbor, we are free, thank God, and as there seems to be no immediate prospect of your further needing my help, I will go and look after the wounded and the ladies. Poor souls, what a fearful time of suspense and terror they must have passed, pent up there in the cabin, listening to all these fearful sounds, and not knowing what it means or what will be the end of it. Lance accordingly descended, to find the ladies pale as death, and their eyes dilated with fear, resolutely doing their best with the aid of the steward to assuage the agonies of the wounded. He was, of course, at once assailed with a hundred questions, to which, however, he put a stop by holding up his hand and laughingly saying, "'Pray, spare me, and show me a little mercy, I beseech you. To answer all your questions would occupy me for the remainder of the night. Be satisfied, therefore, for the present with the general statement that we have successfully launched the schooner, as doubtless you have long ago found out for yourselves, that there has been a terrible earthquake accompanied by a volcanic eruption which bids fair to completely destroy the island, that we are now in the open ocean, having made good our escape, and that there is at present nothing more to fear. Where is May? She is asleep in that berth, answered Mrs. Staunton, so I hope the worst of the poor child's pain is over. No doubt of it, answered Lance. The fact that she is sleeping is in itself a sufficient indication of that. And now let me first thank you for your care of my patients here, to whom I will now myself attend, and next order you all three peremptorily off to bed, away with you at once to the most comfortable quarters you can find, and try to get a good night's rest. Utterly worn out, the ladies were only too glad to obey this order, and they accordingly forthwith retired to the cabins which the steward had already prepared for them. The more severely wounded were then speedily attended to, their injuries carefully dressed, and themselves comfortably bestowed in their hammocks, after which came the turn of the others. By the time that Lance had fully completed his arduous task, the first faint streaks of dawn were lighting up the eastern horizon, and he went on deck to get a breath or two of fresh air. He found the schooner slipping along at a fine pace under every stitch of canvas she could spread, including studding sails, with the breeze about two points on the starboard quarter, a clear sky above her, and a clear sea all round. Away astern, as the light grew stronger, could be seen a dark patch of smoke low down upon the horizon, indicating the position of Albatross Island. But the land itself had sunk below the horizon long before. My story is now ended. Very little more remains to be told, and that little must be told as tersely as possible. The petrel made a very rapid and prosperous passage home, and in due time arrived at Plymouth long before which, however, the wounded had all completely recovered. Here the passengers landed, whilst Captain Staunton proceeded with the schooner to London, where the craft was safely docked and her crew paid off. The skipper then made the best of his way to the office of the owners of the Galatea, where he was received with joyous surprise. His story listened to with the greatest interest, and himself congratulated upon his marvelous escape from the many perils which he had encountered. And, best of all, before the interview terminated, his owners showed in the most practical manner their continued confidence in him by offering him the command of a very fine new ship which they had upon the stocks almost ready for launching. I must leave it to the lively imaginations of my readers to picture for themselves the rapturous welcome home experienced by the other personages who have figured in this story, merely remarking that it left absolutely nothing to be desired its warmth being of itself a sufficient compensation for all the hardship and suffering they had endured. The gold which Bob's forethought had been the means of securing was duly divided equally between all who could fairly be regarded as entitled to a share, and though it certainly did not amount to a fortune apiece, 
it proved amply sufficient to compensate the sharers for their loss of time. On the receipt of his moiety, Bob gave a grand supper to all his friends in Brightlingsea, the which is referred to with justifiable pride by the landlady of the anchor, even unto this day. It was whilst this eventful supper was in full swing that Lance Evelyn unexpectedly made his appearance upon the scene. He was enthusiastically welcomed by Bob, duly introduced to the company, and at once joined them, making himself so thoroughly at home with them, and entering so completely into the spirit of the affair, that he sprang at a single bound into their best graces, and was vehemently declared by one and all to be a real out-and-outer. The next day found him closeted for a full hour with old Bill Maskell, after which, to everybody's profound astonishment, the pair left for London, only to return next day, however, accompanied by a fine, tall, soldierly-looking old man, to whom Bob was speedily introduced, and by whom he was claimed, to his unqualified amazement, as an only and long-lost son. Sir Richard Lassell, for he it was, was indebted to Lance for this joyous discovery, and it was almost pitiful to witness the poor old gentleman's efforts to adequately express his gratitude to Evelyn for the totally unexpected restoration of his son to his arms. Bob, now no longer Bob Ledgerton, but Mr. Richard Lassell, was speedily transferred to his father's house in London, and according to the latest accounts, he is now busy qualifying himself to enter the Navy. Poor old Bill Maskell was in a strangely agitated condition for some time after the occurrence of these events, being alternately in a state of greatest hilarity at Bob's return home, and despondency at the reflection that henceforth the remainder of their lives must be spent apart. Sir Richard has, however, done what he could to console the poor old man by purchasing for him a pretty little cottage and garden in the most pleasant part of Brightlingsea, supplementing the gift with an allowance of one hundred and fifty pounds a year for the remainder of his life. Some two months or so after the arrival home of the petrel, a notice appeared in the Morning Post and other papers announcing a double marriage at St. George's, Hanover Square. The contracting parties being respectively Lancelot Evelyn and Blanche Lassell, and Rex Fortescue and Violet Dudley. There is every reason, therefore, to suppose that those four persons are at last perfectly happy. It has been whispered, in the strictest confidence, of course, that there is some idea of fitting out an expedition to the South Pacific for the purpose of ascertaining whether Albatross Island is still in existence, and, if so, whether there is any possibility of working the enormously rich gold mine, the strange discovery of which is recorded in these pages. Should the expedition be undertaken and carried out with results worthy of note, an effort will be made to collect the fullest particulars, with the view of arranging them in narrative form for the entertainment of such readers as are sufficiently interested in our friends to wish for further intelligence about them. End of chapter 20 End of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood